three, two, one. Aquaman! That was a quote from the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. And I'm not kidding on that one. He does say that. <laughs> Wait, what? He just gets, like in the middle. When? Well, because they were arguing over, I don't know. I think there was like a recording playing of Amber Heard. Um, and they were like arguing over like what their accomplishes were, accomplishments were, or like how much money they made. And you can just hear Johnny Depp, like, I guess, drunkenly or high saying in the background of the recording, like, Aquaman, <laughs> and just the way he said it has never left my mind, and so I can't think of Aquaman without thinking of Johnny Depp saying, "Aquaman." Hi, I'm Adam from Your Movie Sex. This is Sardonic Cast. <laughs> I'm Alex from Aichi, and uh, I can't figure out if it was a good or bad thing that I, I just put the horse blinders on, did not pay any attention to any of that trial at all. I don't know. I'm, I'm starting. I'm oh, starting I wasn't to feel like, like that was into it or anything. I wasn't like... <laughs> it was one of those things where, you know, it was the zeitgeist. Everyone was talking about it every time you opened any social media. There were clips. There was uh, all the tabloid stuff. It was it, like uh, huge news. But I just couldn't be asked to follow it. It made point. a few YouTubers a lot of money in a very short that's amount right. of time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, it's coming back to me now. So like five different YouTubers all with the five million view Amber Heard. Like, holy shit, yeah. Clip videos, yeah. There were, yeah, because people were just like pretty much live covering the trial and... There were like lawyers doing a little discussion and some streamers doing the thing and blah, 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 blah. And it was just, it was the biggest thing for a hot minute. And it was always on the front page of YouTube, no matter what. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what settings. Or and what has, it, has it wound up obliterating both of their careers or at least hurting? I think so, both yeah. Of them? I mean, like, like Johnny Depp's career was hurt before the trial started. But then after the trial, the public perception is just so negatively against amber heard as well that i think it's it would just be difficult to put her in a film and i think honestly they probably they probably cut her from some parts of like i don't know if she was supposed to have a bigger role in this they definitely hit her in the trailer that's that is the at the very 100%. least that seemed true. very intentional yeah but i don't know i uh, if we're talking about the lost kingdom now uh the the final film of the what is it even called? The DCU? The DCEU? I think it was the DCECPU. <laughs> the the DCFUCKU. <laughs> um, I don't know, man. What There was something so funny about the 2018 Aquaman to me. that It was like, we didn't even know we're at the height of the superhero like zeitgeist as far as like, every one of these things could be shut out and would make a billion. Aquaman being in there, that... Uh, Captain Marvel or whatever whatever it was called, these like really middling superhero films, just like they had this audience. And then fast forward half a decade later, and man, here we are with Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And I don't know, I was crestfallen by this. I normally I'm Good I'm word. energized by watching these movies and uh taking like all these notes and like, oh, that was like a fun thing I can think about or ideas to swirl and I don't know, just creative ideas and stuff. And James Wan is fun and all these, all these things that I was kind of hoping for, these basic checklist things. I just felt like I, I didn't get, I did, I barely made any notes. I Damn. just was like, man, forget about this. This was like such a, a, a far ending and uh, yeah, just nothing memorable about this, nothing. I'd rather just watch that original Aquaman film before. And it's not like that first film was like great or anything. In fact, it's actually pretty hilariously bad in a lot of ways and like tonally inconsistent and very odd and yes. just all over the place and like this weird soundtrack and just, yeah, a really weird film. But there's something interesting and engaging about it to me, like in that badness. It's like the perfect level. Whereas this, I don't know. I don't know if it was just tinkered with too much, if it is just the timing of it. Because it is like a long time, yeah, 2018 to 2023, and just the DC universe being so uninteresting, and yeah, I just thought this was a, a wet fart of it's, a film. It's, it's maybe in the worst position to even try to get released. Yeah. You know, out, out of out of superhero film, maybe, maybe outdone by The Flash, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it, if James Wan didn't seem... It didn't seem like his heart was in it. First of all, no. it didn't really seem like no, he was no, trying no. that hard. I agree with you. The James Wan aspects of the first film 
were fun and you could almost t- like see a little bit of it almost mm-hmm. in this movie but most of it just felt like absolutely bland like it could have been any director maybe he just passed the torch off to like josh trank i don't know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who's, yeah. who's looking for work these days i don't know yeah it's a it's a it's a weird position for them to be in when the dce cpu is not <laughs> alive anymore it got minecrafted by James Gunn, actually more like by Zack Snyder. It's getting Frankensteined by James Gunn. And so, yeah, yeah, it, like at the end of The Flash, they're like, um, you can still see Aquaman. It's like both universes, <laughs> which is the funniest thing to try and do for like this one last film, this swan song that's still on their release slate. Uh, it's, it's actually both universes. It's you. It, it's a new one and the old one. You you can see it. I promise. <laughs> and it's not positioned as an ending, and you can tell that. It's not, there's no. nothing. There's no intentional <laughs> no, quality to this whole like universe, and it's not like this is like a bittersweet. This is it's all been building to this, and this no. is the ending type thing. It's Damn. more like oh, we've already sunk enough into this and gotten through the production, and we can't write this off. And we thought we we're gonna make the money the first one did and it's like well something cost at this point let's just release this and see what happens and i suppose it is doing better than the what's it called the marvels the new one it's like tracking yeah. better than that which symbolically That's i'm kind of happy with <laughs> um yeah but i wouldn't actually be surprised if that film is better than this um to be honest uh not that i've seen it yet We'll see about that in time, but I I wouldn't be expecting or anything. Well, here's the big thing, that. though, Adam. Here's the big thing. That film is ninety minutes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Whereas, well, this is this is two hours four minutes. The original Aquaman was actually quite long. It was like two hours twenty minutes long. But I can remember some scenes from that film. Mm-hmm. Like, what even happens in this film? They bring the uh, Black Manta back, and he's kind of he's controlled by a a staff that makes you channel an undead army kind of like lord of the rings yeah but i was i was gonna <laughs> i was gonna bring up lord of the rings <laughs> yeah this, this movie reminded me of a lot of other movies just not as good as those yeah it has like the adventure elements it's like yeah, yeah we're in the desert now doing an indiana jones thing in the in the temple and we bring and then they try to do the like family thing because bringing back the villain from the first movie, the baby the decision I, I kind of like it's kind of funny to bring that villain back try and add some depth or some dynamic or humor um like <laughs> oh man the humor what 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 are they doing with this i think it is really fitting the 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 villain the the, the final frame the final shot the final scene in the entirety of the dc eu is the villain from this film eating a cockroach and a sandwich or burger, a big greasy burger. I think that's symbolically quite nice, actually. Oh, yeah. And does <laughs> summarize this entire project in, like, mm. an image. Uh, Slimy but man, yeah. and satisfying. <laughs> no, but at least in The Lion King, those, those bugs look kind of yummy, you know? True. There's nothing yummy about this film. No. Nothing. I There was a... The crab... The big crab man sounded like Gimli, but it was actually Martin Short. <laughs> was well, there was Gimli. I swear he was in this film. It, sa- it sounded like Gimli, but I, I think he, I think Martin Short played that. No, character. I think those are two different characters. There's two different characters. Yeah. Oh but my there God. are two giant crab characters what? that look similar. You're right. Yeah, yeah. What the but fuck? one is voiced by Gimli, and oh, one actually? is voiced by Martin Short. Yeah, I'm serious. Well, then what the yeah. fuck? They, well, they're just doing Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even make the. Uh... Is, it, is it an homage? <laughs> is it an homage? I don't know. <laughs> homage, yeah. I, For, I'm a let I don't know homage. what they're doing with this. <laughs> and just, oh, one, oh, every, everything was so like obligated about the film. Yeah. Like Nicole Kidman looking crazy in there, just like saying her really boring lines. No one, it, it, in that first Aquaman, it felt like people were kind of having fun. Yes. <laughs> you know, like when they were on the set, they were, <laughs> they, they were leaning into it. They, they were chewing the scenery hardcore, but like Willem Dafoe was in there and they were, they were, you know, they were doing their job. Whereas here it felt like, oh, so obligated and yeah, like tired. No one's and having no fun. No one's really into it. No one cares about it. There are kind of rumors about the bad state of affairs on set and whatnot and Jason Momoa not being that into it. And I can't even blame him at a certain point. No. Like, do your job and do what you're paid for. But I do not really even blame these half assed performances because there's plenty of like capable actors in here. But like mm-hmm. what what you it doesn't translate to anything uh fun on screen or memorable or no just the it, whole pacing of it too like there's no like what's the big 
crescendo action moment? What's the big payoff? Like, uh, is it, well, Amber Heard doesn't get fleshed out. There's the whole no. like baby thing. Is like the new story beat, I guess. That yeah, Arthur Curry and Mera have a baby because there's like a there's like an infamous Aquaman comic where the baby gets killed by Black oh. Manta. Oh, so I was like, that's what okay, had, that's what they were trying to yeah. make people think maybe. So I was like, oh come on. That sounds hilarious. Like James Wan adapting that story, that could be as like funny bad as the first Aquaman, or at least entertaining. Like trying to trying to adapt that and having James Wan do it is like intriguing at least. But they do nothing with it. Nothing. I don't know if that's partially because of the Amber Heard drama and they felt like trapped by having. Because I think Black Manta like kills her as well or something in the in this original story. I'm not an Aquaman fan. I think he's. I think this whole attempt at making Aquaman cool is like the funniest, lamest. Just everything about it is like so hilarious and badly a- approached and handled and just yeah, the, the the poisoning of this whole idea and how sad it is where we've gone is it's just like boring. I found it funny that they couldn't even let the audience believe for like a nanosecond that the baby was in any kind of danger. Because yeah. they have the they had the part where he was like, okay, I'm gonna kidnap him, and then it 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 the scene logically just cuts to the house is on fire and the dad's like outside. He's like, oh, blah blah blah, what happened? Um, but right before that, as he's as he's coming, he says out loud, "I'm gonna leave you alive so that he can watch yeah. you die." It's like, damn, like you really. You you could have just let us believe for a millisecond that the baby w- might have been dead or might have been like we we don't know what's happened to the baby you know that would be something narratively you could get yeah. something out of but they don't let you believe that they don't let you believe that for even a millisecond he just he, he immediately says <laughs> I'm going to leave you alive so that he could watch you die and it's like okay well. We would have we would have had that found out as soon as Aquaman went up to his dad and asked what happened. Like he would have just said like, "Oh, he kidnapped the baby," right? Mm-hmm. We would have we would have had that resolution. It's okay, you know. Like the 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 people in the audience that are all parents and now their brains are chemically, uh, you know, biased <laughs> to have baby brain. <laughs> Those people would be fine. They would only cry for like two seconds. But unfortunately, we live in a baby supremacist society, and uh, <laughs> we can see who's really in power here. We can see who's, who, who we know who's in control by who you can't criticize. Babies, the babies, babies yeah, are the, controlling the boss our government. I mean, this has about as much complexity as a boss baby film. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's <probably good. laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, so we got Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we got. I've just I wrote down a couple notes of like just immediately the this this barrage of of bad uncoordinated movie editing and and just <laughs> all of this like immediately at the beginning um the the way that uh the way that his dialogue was edited it it felt like it oh, was yeah. so rushed he would say he had this opening monologue like everyone's good at something want to hear something else I'm good at one thing kicking butt and that's like that's about how closely together those lines were edited. It was like it was like yeah. how I edit my YMS review videos. Like no space mm-hmm. in between any <laughs> yeah. of the sentences. I'm like, holy shit, right? Like, did, did you just not think about the cadence as you were filming it, or it's all an afterthought, or just like what what went on here to make that editing happen and make it feel so uncomfortably rushed? And then just fuck <laughs> before I even have time to think about any of that. Born to be wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, is this an Illumination movie? Like, I mean, I, I, I it's they've they've done it before in these fucking DC. There were some Superman, weird music Aquaman, choices in the first the Aquaman too. To be fair, was it like Pitbull true? Yeah, song it's it's at least like consistent that. in that way. But it just it felt like an absolute barrage to the senses, which I was kind of into because that's kind of what I wanted out of seeing a shit movie. But then the rest of it was just so boring and it just it just it meshed into each other and just blended into this big CG mess where all I can observe is just, oh, that looks like it cost a lot of money, but for no 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 purpose emotionally, like no one's into this. Like I, I see a lot of scenes where the implication is that I'm supposed to be excited, but I'm just exhausted and yeah, uh, yeah. Cat BF fell asleep. (laughs) <laughs> and I didn't wake him up. <laughs> Any other movie, I would have woken him up. 
But I'm like, no, nah, you can sleep through this one. We, you need some energy <laughs> for the next movie. It's, a, it's somehow a sleepy barrage <laughs> of senses. It's, it's a very, I wrote, two of my notes at different points in the movie were so sleepy. <laughs> Just, <laughs> with, yeah. with a lot of ease. <laughs> That's what's so strange, though, because that, that 2018 movie also was a barrage of senses, but it was... I don't know. It was kind of fun. There was some. There was some fun moments, like the the moment on the boat, the the more horror uh, scene with these weird monsters kind of chasing him down into the depths of the ocean, and this whole like battle scene from the end of the first movie. We have the the red army going against the blue army, or whatever the hell it was, like giant sharks and all this nonsense. Yeah, and, it's. I can actually remember fun. some like scenes. Yeah, it's some super it cheesy, is super campy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's too long. It's bloated as hell, and it's like a mess. Um, and the writing's really bad, and the dialogue's really bad. But it was there were at least some moments. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, what's what's like the moments here? What what are the what is the justification? What is what is the main character's arc? Like, what does he even go through? <laughs> like uh, nothing. He, um, <laughs> I don't know. He's a cool dude. He's a bro. <laughs> He's a surfer guy, and he goes. Whee! All the time. That's yeah. his like main character attribute is that weird squeal. <laughs> they like that love that funny, squeal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like honestly, if if they had really leaned into that 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 campiness, the goofiness, and just had this villain who is you know he's two dimensional. He's <laughs> he's powered by this staff that just makes him want hyper revenge, and he has the power to do it now. And then actually follow through on that idea in like a ninety minute like just not taking itself seriously, playful, goofy as hell, could be fine. It could be fun, even. But they don't even do that. They can't commit to anything. It's just so... It just feels focus-tested. It feels completely controlled and not like a James Wan film, really. There's no fun writing. There's there's nothing. You know what it reminded me of a lot? What? Valerian. It was a very Valerian so, yes, type film. Yes, I had that same thought. That is a, yeah, thanks for reminding <laughs> me of that. Cause it, yeah, I had that exact same thought. Because, yeah, look, all these like CG monsters and all yeah. these like random environments the and like the plot peeps. having no real focus and like them just doing side quests for like 15 minutes and then it just does another side quest for 15 minutes that doesn't link to anything. And it's, yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of a ideas comparison. that don't really get fleshed out or properly explored or you know, a lot of concepts for scenes where it's like okay and then move on to the next one and it's like well that wasn't yeah. even that wasn't even fun but okay <laughs> we're going on to the next one <laughs> yeah because honestly the that trilogy of having aquaman his brother and like a cg octopus like exploring a desert there's there's something kind of absurdly funny about that to me um if they'd like again leaned into it or like done something with it instead of it just being yeah. for remember all 20 those, minutes or whatever remember all those like gadgets from valerian there's kind of a they, 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 yeah. they kind of do some of the same stuff in this movie maybe to not is it extreme of a degree there was that uh he has an invisible suit remember the like tiny suit and it's mm. like stretched really tight and for some reason it cloaks his whole body even though it doesn't cover his face or hands but okay <laughs> do they just i don't even remember if they used it in the movie did did he use it and then like like oh yeah he used it like as they were running away um from the desert it was to like break out his brother and then it was just like a never again sort of thing yeah because that was kind of like that was sort of the equivalent scene of that first movie with the like more horror design where these like xenomorph yeah monsters like come out of the sand and are like chasing them it's like what the <laughs> what yeah. is the like visual stylings or language of this universe because it just seems like completely random like in how it presents itself uh like why are there like talking crabs and but also like sharks and big demons like it's a very strange like were there yeah universe. were there like human hybrid aqua people in the first movie i remember there being a giant crab and it's because the uh the the gimli character references his like claw being chopped off in the first movie i think so i think that's that's supposed to be the same oh. character because there's like a the, the the pacing the first movie is so nuts and it like just jumps mm. around like crazy um i'm pretty sure there is like a like a five minute montage that like does some brief world building of like yeah there there are the different game of thrones underwater families and this sort of thing um yeah yeah but there was it's, uh, yeah, it's very bad there was that short moment where he's interrogating the like star wars fish guy and yeah he's like oh you could put on the helmet and fill it up with oxygen 
And it's like he's yeah. drowning underwater, but it's oxygen. And it's like that was an awful scene. Yeah, it's, that was it's like a horrendous. Scene. I can see what you thought that idea could do on paper, and conceptually, it might be like a tiny funny thing, but it just was not pulled off properly. It was one of it's like liter- that's literally a SpongeBob gag. Oh, is like it sandy cheeks of with the <laughs> you know like they have to wear the the water bowl on on their heads when they go into Sandy's house, and she's got mm-hmm. the the water bowl. Yeah. Bear bowl i guess outside of it <laughs> is spongebob lo- like logic but you could see you, like you could imagine spongebob like running around this universe he might as well be into the roster honestly at this know? point <laughs> make it more entertaining <laughs> yeah That's it's uh doing. aquaman is this weird film even within the dc ecpu where the <laughs> like w- was it the first one that was kind of like leaning into I guess the tone that we now more associate with uh, James Gunn, like having a bit of color, yeah, and, like characters smiling and like, that's laughing. What, and stuff I think like that's that. kind of why it stood out at the time. Is it felt like they were trying to experiment and be like, okay, maybe not everything has to be what Zack Snyder wants, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think it started all falling apart once that the, the BVS stuff like it did it did well but not as well as they'd hoped and they started then panicking and green lighting things like joker <laughs> like aquaman like yeah. all these random like let's just let's just shotgun approach see what sticks type thing and uh yeah you wind up with the bizarre film that is 2018 aquaman um and in that craziness you do get some moments but yeah that craziness just seems so like filtered and forgotten now and like god dolph lundgren like he's so bad in this Everyone's so like flat and just doesn't care. Like you mentioned the Martin Short voice, but and how bad that scene is. But I don't know what it is about Mar- Martin Short. Like b- being typecast is just if if you need like if you have a weird character that's in a film for like ten minutes, just <laughs> cast Martin Short and he'll do like an annoying screaming thing, like Treasure Planet, whatever. Mm-hmm. Just like tank the film for a little bit. I don't know what what the deal is if he's got like some contract in Hollywood to be that guy. But that that's like a horrendous horrendous scene um and randall park as well who uh, he, he could be funny he can be fine but uh he's like the the moral is he the scientist man. Yeah. yeah he was bad yeah, actually like, yeah, he, he did a bad awful. job yeah c- completely <laughs> awful um because he's the one who like figures he like knows the tr- he's like, the expedition dump excuse you know and the scientist who knows the truth of how the the spear thing works yeah. and yeah, this is so I can explain it to the audience type thing. That was a bad performance, and him and Amber Heard stuck out the worst. Despite not having a lot of screen time, they stuck out. Well, the yeah, most what does she even do? Bad. She's like, she like. It's very funny when they act when the baby's stolen, and they're all getting their like reaction shots, and uh, my baby. Like, yeah, they're all losing it, and it makes you wonder, like, was was it? Were these like takes of them acting as if the baby had been killed and it's all been like messed with and like reshot? Because it, it like d- the emotions like didn't match like what was happening. It was something no. very like this is very strange. Like how this is jumping around and how yeah nothing's earned. It's all just everything's too easy or convenient. You just don't care after a while because it's like yeah you're showing me all these flashy colors and CG goobers like bouncing <laughs> into each other and whatever. But man, I I just can't. Yeah, I'm with you. I just could not pay attention. After it's a, a it's a sleepy type film. <laughs> it's yeah. a Valerian sleepy type film. <laughs> Valerian was more engage more engaging and memorable. So even in that sense, like you know, it's copying Lord of the Rings. It's copying Valerian. It's I like <laughs> Valerian has more you can remember about it. We'll be talking about. We'll be comparing things to Valerian until the end of time. Forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be forgetting There's about something Aquaman. unique about Valerian. <laughs> And it just felt like James Wan, he clearly found some enjoyment in that first Aquaman through some of that spectacle action and like the set pieces you could achieve with this enormous budget and the freedom to just do craziness underwater and have people being held up on strings with the CG hair to, and all, all this kind of stuff. And it just seems like exhausted, I guess, after that experience. And it's like, well, I've, I've kind of done it once. Like, what can I even do now? I guess, yeah xenomorphs in the desert what even big spectacle is there at the end there's like these this old 
Atlantean technology that's a part of the movie with these like mech suit type things, which looked okay or an okay design. But again, they didn't really do anything with them. There are no there are no like strict rules or even like an attempt to flesh out like interesting rules or a dynamic that is just anything interesting beyond like surface level, like kind of like that Uncharted film from a few years back level of just like safe adventure also very film. forgettable <laughs> yeah forgettable <laughs> forgot that nothing happened. happens yeah yeah exactly and it's like very similar sort of filmmaking in my mind and yeah kind of equally forgettable yeah james wan um he's uh recently announced that he's doing his uh dream project <laughs> which What's might that? be a result of working on Aquaman. <laughs> and he's like, eh, maybe I should do what I what my heart's in. So he's going to be a, a, allegedly, reportedly working on a uh, Call of Cthulhu adaptation, mm, HP okay. Lovecraft, which could be really cool. Okay, if you, you had to know. do that to get that made, if you had to do this to get that made, yeah. then I can I can forgive it a bit more. And yeah, he can get, he can get his bag if he wants, but man, get it. What a just ugh, this whole year for the superhero movies has just been something else and uh yeah I say, i'm glad there's only one there's only one like mcu movie next year it's like it's mostly just what sony now who's like clinging on oh so the sony ones will be funny though yeah exactly yeah the sony yeah, ones will have hopefully some be more like them. the first aquaman <laughs> <laughs> yeah or even worse potentially like with how they yeah. look but uh, fucking did you see the madame madame web trailer yet oh yeah it's yeah, so crazy yeah, I actually can't wait for that. It, lo it looks so so bad. So, it's just such an awful idea, like in every way. I hope they stick to their guns. I hope I hope they don't see people's <laughs> reaction to the trailer and like try and restructure or <laughs> edit it down. I hope they just let it be whatever the fuck it, <laughs> whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> That's what yeah, I, I don't want. Know if the there's most. any fix in that, even if they wanted to. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, reshoot the whole movie. Um, I'm just gonna mention a couple moments of note that I have in my notes here. I had the luxury of seeing it yesterday, so there's a few <laughs> there's a few things I remember about this movie. Um, <laughs> there's uh, so right after the uh, scientist guy is like, "Oh, I'm spilling the beans," just immediately from behind them in the door, the explosion happens and knocks Jason Mimosa out of the window. And he gets up, he's like, "I hate when that happens." I'm like, yeah, "That's a that's a nod. That? It's a nod to the first film because remember in the first film." There's like six different scenes where somebody just explodes out of a wall out of nowhere. That I liked. <laughs> oh, that's what that was yeah. nodding to. Okay. So it only funny. happened once in this film. <laughs> but as soon as he said that, I'm like, what does that mean? And I'm like, yeah, oh, lean yeah. into the absurdity. That was yeah. the criticism that a lot of people had of the first movie is that like every scene ended with an explosion out of the side <laughs> of the wall. <laughs> that's what I like about Transition it. <laughs> to the next scene. So that was cool. Um, the uh oh god this was so fucking weird but i had to write it down right after uh i think it's i don't, I don't remember exactly when this yeah right after they kidnapped the babe aqua baby um yeah. the shot ends on jason mimosa and he's like no and they <laughs> actually do the slow-mo choppy frame rate because they yeah. didn't film in high frame rate i'm like this is the year 2023. Yeah, I haven't seen this no shit for, for decades. <laughs> I haven't seen this shit for decades. I thought it was a relic. I thought it was a remnant of like what people thought movies were could do <laughs> in the 90s or early 2000s, right? Like that that the last movie we talked about that did that was probably like Hypercube, right? <laughs> yeah. Jeez, I, was I remember shocked. um uh Capote doing it a little bit. Oh yeah, Capote. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. But it is normally a sign of like, yeah, oh, we didn't plan for this, or we didn't have the no. tech to pull off this, this <laughs> slow-mo shot, so let's just, oh, we need it for this this kind of pacing in, in the edit, so it matches this feeling, or whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, there's lots of that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a part where the whales show up, and they use sonar to blow up the people in the ship. That was just, that happened, and then, in, that, <laughs> and then that was it. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> Um, was it <laughs> it was you know some of my notes were not because they were notable but because i knew that they were so not notable that i would have to write it down in my notes to remember it <laughs> just so you remember it happened, exactly yeah. and so we can avoid having like the 
what happened in this movie? And if I can just refresh our memories a little, <laughs> we can remember that there were actually things that happened, kind of. <laughs> yeah, because I saw this. I saw this like a week ago. And yeah, I've got to admit, it's difficult to remember nearly anything that happened in this. Yeah, one week would be just gone from my memory. <laughs> one day is already a lot. <laughs> there was one shot of Aquaman, like right before the uh, Gimli puts on his helmet. Sorry, right after Gimli puts on his hel- helmet. He's like, thank you, your highness. And the entire shot of Jason says face was CG. So like the rest of the movie... They filmed their faces and maybe they had like CG hair or whatever, but the yeah. entirety of him was CG and it was really noticeable. It was like one of those like chrono bull flat the flash shots, maybe not as bad, mm-hmm. but still like, damn, like, did you forget to film him or why did you, <laughs> why did, why was his entire face CG? That was interesting. There is something rushed about it. Yeah. Very. And, and the flash definitely would have been a funnier ending than, than this. The flash should have been the last movie. Yeah. Honestly, this yeah. this feels like the go out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go. yeah, just take the loss on Blue Beetle. Take the loss on this. Just like tax right off. Yeah, like. go go out with <laughs> becoming Death Destroyer of Worlds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, it's so embarrassing. This whole project. Damn, and it's they really so didn't sad. like even even the like post credits was just like mm, cockroach burger, <laughs> like that's. <laughs> Like, it, that's what they decided to, that's the, that's the full if, stop <laughs> if they were gonna pretend like this was like oh you can watch this movie too it's actually in both universes they should have reshot a post credits thing that got some people hyped for whatever james gunn thing is supposed to come out right yeah yeah it seems like they something. just gave up it seems like they're like nah that was actually a lie <laughs> we tricked you and we're just <laughs> we never just gonna acknowledge care. this ever again yeah <laughs> like that's honestly what it seems like and while the film before the film was even out they're like jason momo was on the pity tours like yeah i don't think i'm ever going to be aquaman again basically just being like yeah he sucked he sucks like, <laughs> <laughs> so like, what's he, like, what hope did it even have like n- the lead doesn't care like at least when uh the uh what's his face tom holland like when he's in something bad he'd be like yeah at least i like tried (laughs) like where this is a nah no who cares no (laughs) next (laughs) yeah and uh with that i agree next (laughs) i'm giving this one a fucking two out of ten what more do we say about this keep rambling on fuck this movie fuck it yeah fuck this movie one and a half star from me just generous expect (laughs) Expect better from you, James Swan. <laughs> Need more from you, you know. <laughs> James Swan song of the D C P U. Um, yeah, Aquaman and the Lost Script. Lost Memory. Yeah. And the Lost Franchise. And the Last <laughs> Plan. <laughs> or I'd be, lack yeah, thereof. I'd, I'd be happy if we just never see this character adapted into a film like ever again. I don't think we will. <laughs> I think I think in like twenty years from now. Maybe like, oh, superhero movies are coming back. They'll do like the whole, like in The Flash, they had uh, Nick Cage Superman. They'll do that with yeah. Jay. We'll, Jay. We'll get another Jason Mimosa Aquaman in that <laughs> in that type of capacity, probably. We'll, we'll have him like AI generated or something. Maybe. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, how was your Crimbus? It was lovely. Busy. I got like an enormous family, so it it gets pretty hectic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's nice. Yeah, it's like a nice family recharge. Can catch up with everyone, see everyone. Yeah, yeah. It was it was nice. What about you? It was very interesting. Um, we did an early Christmas. Well, we did. My parents are like driving in their motorhome across the states, being being retired, mm. um, and uh, they wanted to do Christmas in L.A. So we met them. Uh, me, my brother, his wife, and um, my my BF, and uh, we did an early Christmas because uh, my BF needed to be uh, back home to see his family, and then I think my brother and his wife wanted to see like his wife's family, and so we just did like a Christmas not on Christmas. Oh, how was it early? I've never done that. I mean, it's the exact same. Like, I don't. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just like it's a literally the exact event. same. It's the exact yeah. same except stores are open if you need something <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, there's no you don't need to do sounds it sounds like good to be honest yeah yeah, yeah if yeah. you're if your schedules don't require the holiday 
like federally off, then do it whenever the fuck you want. It doesn't matter. Um, but I got back to Atlanta, which is where I'm visiting right now. Um, and I have a friend who lives in Vancouver. Oh, the one that gave you super weed, LW. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I've got no memory of that, man. <laughs> of course. And uh, so his family was doing, his family's in Atlanta. And so he was doing Christmas here. And so I was invited for a Christmas Eve and a Christmas Day thing. And it's a big Italian family. And so that was kind of a new nice. experience for me. They cook a fucking 20 pizzas at least. There were like 20. They had Whoa. like all this like pre made things of dough. They have a wood fire oven in their backyard. There was like oh, so gosh, much. Yeah. They had like brisket. They had like. Uh, they had lobster mac and cheese. They had fucking like they. It was it was insane how much food there was, and it was constantly being cooked throughout the entire night. And uh, damn, it was a very fulfilling <laughs> yeah, experience. Yeah, sounds it. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. They were cool people. His sister looks exactly like um, Mary Elizabeth Win- Winstead. Not oh, really? exactly, but close. So it was kind of funny because I watched all the Black Christmas movies the day after that. All three, the whole trilogy. Speaking of Crimbus, Mamma Mia, we watched Black <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> the Black Christmas, the tale of the lost sequels. Very interesting trilogy that we decided to do because we decided to cover the original film, and the two remakes, because I always think that it's kind of interesting to compare uh, the original films and remakes. Some of my pop- most popular videos on my channel are just me being like, OK, what did this movie do right? What did this movie do wrong? How did they miss? The- how-, how did they misunderstand the assignment? Yeah, and it helps you appreciate the original more, too. Or exactly. Recognize yeah. what it what it did right. Yeah. yeah. So Black Christmas is a 1974 film. It's Canadian. Uh, it is directed by Bob Clark, who also did A Christmas Story <laughs> and Porky's and Baby Geniuses. And the Baby Genius, yeah. Of course. Thank you for, you have to include that one, yeah. <laughs> uh, so in very interesting filmography. Um, this is considered by many to be the first slasher, but like, I, it really depends on how you define it because... Um, you know, supposedly this is inspired by, uh, like the Italian, uh, groups of films called like G- Giolan. Fuck. I was, <laughs> I should have, I should have this next to me. I always, uh, mispronounce it, but, uh, things like, uh, Dario Argento films like Suspiria and, you know, like kind of, um, like murder mystery, women dying, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Like um, Psycho, any of these. Yeah, kind of. I don't. Is Psycho considered one of those? I you, see. I'm confused as to whether or not they not need like to explicitly full, be Italian films. <laughs> it's not full slasher, but also I feel like talking about what slasher is in 2023 is different to very different what that would have meant back in the day. And 74 yeah. is obviously the year this came out, and that is pre a lot of the most famous ones, like mm-hmm. Halloween or whatever. Yes. And, uh, yeah. I guess this is the first one to be. It specifically is thought to be the one with the uh, featuring the uh, the killer's point of view, like in the Plinkett style, like uh, actually showing that perspective is like one of the new innovations of this movie. And one of did the, you did you call it the Plinkett style? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was thinking about the, the Plinkett thing. I'm like, oh, they must have been inspired. My by this. God, yeah. that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is kind of. Pl- <laughs> Plinket style. <laughs> Straight up, yeah. Because I remember, like, yeah, watching that review and being like, oh, "This is fun." Like, they've clearly got an att- a camera attached to him. Yeah. And you're seeing both both arms ah. of the character doing stuff and Where's doing my VHS. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah. And with him being like a, a serial killer, well, like a uh, yeah, a character. True. Who's hurting people and all this like horror kind of inspiration that's in those yeah. those reviews. I was thinking about that from so Black uh, Christmas from inspired. Halloween and the Plinket reviews and nothing else. I, w- I would be surprised. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, it does, yeah, now that you mention it, I'm like, oh yeah, that is <laughs> very similar. But you know, it's the, 
what Black Christmas, what it seems like has happened, and I haven't watched every movie ever of all time, so I'm just, you know, <laughs> basing well, this off haven't. of a few different things. Well, I've, first of all, I've never finished a movie. But second, I haven't <laughs> watched every movie. I haven't even started every movie. Um, what it seems like is is that this film has, at the very least, inspired a lot um, and can be essentially considered to be responsible for a lot of the tropes and a lot of the uh, familiar aspects of mostly slasher films that we see today. And honestly, I I was pretty surprised at how mature this film was because when I think slasher films and if I, you know, if I go and think like, oh yeah, the first slasher or some people consider it to be like at least inspiring a lot of slashers, I would expect it to be kind of immature <laughs> and kind That's, of Yeah. That's you know, much more what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting it to be as psychological mm -hmm. as it is, you know, embracing that bottle movie fear of there's something in this space with you. There's someone, an intruder in the house and it keeps it simple. It doesn't like over explain anything. It's just a simple premise kind of executed to uh, like a really high standard. The, this was quite surprising to me. Um, yeah, because I was expecting something a lot more campy, a lot more goofy. But yeah, I found like, especially after watching these three, <laughs> there was uh, a lot to be gained, a lot to be appreciated by uh, the approach of this movie. And especially, I, I wasn't really frightened by much of it for the first half or so, mm -hmm. but it was actually steering into territory. It was like, oh, that was like a memorably frightening yes. image you just put in there or like some creepy, oh, the, the, the way you frame this and the, like the using shadows to and uh, silhouettes and this just creepy motion and creepy images and like never never truly revealing uh the, the card the full hand and especially where where it ends there there is something creepy and deserved and earned about that like atmosphere it builds up and yeah there's some really good like technique in there for building up the horror and mm -hmm. playing the sound and this kind of stuff yeah the imagery is really memorable in this film and especially in combination with the sound design, uh, which I thought was overall fantastic. There's maybe like a couple things where it's like, okay, you got to like blame the time period maybe that it was made. Yeah, yeah, you um, get over that in the first 15 minutes or but so. Yeah, all things considered, the choices for how sound is used in each scene um, and not just things as simple as like, oh yeah, the killer's making like scary noises in the phone and like, you know, you can kind of yeah. hear phone static or blah, 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 blah and he sounds weird. But also, what is the background noise in that scene? You know, in the, in that first phone call, it's like Christmas choirs, and I love that juxtaposition. And it seems yeah, it yeah. seems a lot more sinister than if you were to just play like stock scary music or like ooh, like you're supposed to be scared by this. I like that there's a level of confusion. I like that there's a level of uh, you know just genuine atmosphere to this film. Um, I like that you can hear him like breathing behind the camera in the PO POV shots. Mm. Um, there's a lot of really great choices that, you know, I don't know how far we can trace back these types of choices, but uh, just work incredibly well for the feelings and emotions that they're trying to express in this film. I was I was pretty I was pretty uh, pleasantly surprised by it. I wasn't expecting to like it this much no yeah i'm right there with you because as a rule in the horror genre slasher films they're not really my favorite in fact a lot of the time i kind of purposefully ignore them unless they're like really well reviewed or regarded or whatnot like i like halloween i think there's a lot of tension and good stuff in there but broadly that's just it's just not usually my thing because i just feel like i do usually prefer the more psychological angle the more just more going on than just uh yeah that kind of simplicity of there's normally some figure, whether it be like a, a big monster or a thing, some supernatural thing that is chasing a group of people. And it's, I guess the, the hook is kind of who's going to survive. Are they going to survive? Yada, 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 this group getting smaller as it, as it goes along. But yeah, as I say, with the psychological element, I feel like that, that focus um, kind of elevates it for me. And uh there is there is like a real growing tension throughout the film, and I I start getting more engaged specifically when it started leaning more into the kind of procedural detective aspect as mm -hmm. well. Um, I just was not expecting 
for it to go in that direction and to kind of treat itself. While it's definitely doing a lot of uh, humor or attempts at humor, some of which I think are firmly rooted in like 70s sense of humor um, or stylings of humor, like the uh, the older woman character. Miss like, Mac. Seen. Yeah. MVP. She's, like, finding, <laughs> hiding bottles in every room and whatnot. And uh, that's like her recurring gag. Love it. And yeah, she was fun. It's a little bit more, straight up more goofy and uh, going for that humorous side but it, it does treat itself with like credence and respect and when it when it comes down to it and when the the drama hits there are it takes itself seriously there is like the whole like abortion subplot and that argument yeah and the, the whole kind of big question mark the looming whodunit nature of it of like oh so who who actually is doing this and yeah, the way that's wrapped up is quite satisfying as well. Cause it's like I feel like it's 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 wrapped up in the in the creepiest possible way. Yeah, spoiler discussion, everybody. I forgot to mention, but you know. Yeah, yeah. You've heard this podcast before, unless you haven't. But yeah, spoiler discussion for everything. <laughs> and uh, while while some of the mechanics of how they do build up to that ending have me scratching my head, I feel like yeah, it, they leaned into that rule of cool imagery thing sometimes which i feel like is justified if it is as kind of poignant as i think the whole just imagery of the the girl kind of strapped to that rocking chair with the plastic wrapped around her face and you can see mm -hmm. like her eyes through it it's like quite a quite a cool image to, to center it all around and keep returning to and then ultimately end on um and have that that kind of miserable open and open ending where the you don't get a, a clear conclusion and it's left yeah. open that is that is the correct choice at the end um makes it much scarier because yeah. i was saying throughout the whole thing with the person i was watching to like that the, the red herring is clearly the the peter character the kia della how do you say his name kia dalia the guy from uh uh 2001 yeah um he's the boyfriend character He's got a very uh, recognizable face, that fella. But uh, mm -hmm. he, yeah, he was kind of a fun character, and yeah, he's more the red herring. And he's like, as that fun scene where he smashes up the piano, and he's just kind of acting weird and suspicious. And yeah, I kind of like that side of it too. Yeah, you can tell that he's got some like dis disturbing things going on in his mind. Yeah, that you're wondering, like, could that be a sign? Could that be? <laughs> could that lead? But it would to just be too simple if it was him type yeah. thing. Like, like they could, they they really couldn't have had him be it because it would have, it would have taken a layer away from the film. Well, I do like that of. they were actually. I don't know because there was that moment where she's like, "Well, it couldn't have been because he was with me." Blah, 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 blah. But I guess like, yeah, the calls are coming from inside the house. I was a bit confused about that. I don't know if it's possible to call yourself from your own house in a landline. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah. I was like, did he Unless... install a second line? <laughs> that, yeah, I don't know if In that the was the implication because there was like a phone line at the top. I don't know if they were saying, I don't know what they were saying with that. Cause... He hacked it. Now, I don't know if it's just the three of these movies blending together, but was it, <laughs> was it established in this one that like this, this guy lived there before? Or was that one of the other movies? <laughs> that was one of the other, that was, that was the 2006 sequel where we got the lore of that okay okay so it this one this, this one, one was more this restrained. is the one where <laughs> yeah and he's kept it, it's kept Sorry, not sequel remake and it's 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 so vague and they never really reveal anything right that's kind of this movie's approach like they don't and that is the correct approach yeah. <laughs> for this type of character it's not it's immediately that that tension's immediately dissipated when the context of why this this man is just in this house like why he's there why why is he killing the the question of why is kind of the scary part and leaving it unanswered keeps it scary. So it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of as simple as that, like just keep it simple and stupid. And that's what they did. And the complexity comes more from how you unravel that story, how you present it, how you, how you scare the audience, how you build up the tension. And yeah, I was, I, I got the shiver down my spine uh, with that shot of the, the eye through the, the gap in the door. Mm. That's like, yeah, that's a great ooh, shot. I've, I've, I've had some like intrusive like uh, uh, fever dreams that are kind of like that kind of thing, and it's like, oh, like people Damn. in my house, people in my space. I hate that kind of imagery and that commitment to never fully showing him too. Like you see, you think you see him, you see this kind of like blonde guy with the long, the long hair skulking around, and you'd get like a, a, a couple frames here and there, but it's never, you never get like a comfortable look at whoever the guy is. And I think that yeah, that's that's a good approach. That's a 
it's the perfect horror approach we're talking about we want to see yeah it almost it almost leaves room for like a supernatural explanation or at least yeah inter- interpretation that's, that's the joy of leaving it open yeah where yeah. it doesn't it doesn't ba- it doesn't babadook itself where it's like yeah at the halfway <laughs> point they show it and then it kind of diffuses all the tension true you know, just to maintain good, it throughout the whole thing we're, we should keep using that it doesn't babadook itself <laughs> yeah this pl- this plinket type film <laughs> <laughs> um well yeah i mean like i think i think that you kind of have to give a bit of room in your mind for like a supernatural interpretation considering the multiple voices on the phone that are happening simultaneously and like i don't know i guess you could maybe you know maybe that one call wasn't from in the house and maybe someone else's house but like i think i uh, there has to be at least i don't know in my mind like ghosts or like demons or some weird unholy thing happening here that isn't just purely like a murderer and that's it is how i feel like it works both ways too which is another strength yeah like you can i think you can just interpret it as just say it's just some someone who's lost their mind someone who's they have something that's going on Mm -hmm. and not knowing what is happening and the the randomness of it the fact there is no obvious link it's not like I don't know, it's not like a tragic link where it's revealed in the third act that it was an ex-boyfriend who, you know, all this kind of stuff or whatever. It's it's just a mystery. It's mm-hmm. just a killer that they don't know about, and it's tense because you as an audience member know he's sneaking around because you get to watch him do it. You get to see him climbing up the side of the house. You get to see him creepily watching them from the stairs and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. That is scary. Like trying to watch these and it's fun watching these characters trying to figure out what is going on and like how, how they can get out of it and how, yeah how they can escape the situation um but the the main thing that was kind of making that whole tension sometimes fall through to me and it's what made me not fully love the movie was yeah this kind of commitment to the the rule of cool type storytelling where th- there's just no point where i'm not asking the question once the cops are involved and the main character has <laughs> all been like the story has been told in some degree and they know that there's someone in the house why did they not search the house well, like, why, yeah like, <laughs> they could have <laughs> that, they big... could have resolved some issues by looking in the attic <laughs> i think that yeah i think that maybe now nowadays we're so much more familiar with like what officers would probably do <laughs> like i think i think the number one thing they do is search the house i think that's the first thing they do when the missing person right yeah and i kept thinking about how in something like hellraiser where there is this space that keeps being returned to where yeah. there is like the supernatural element how that wasn't a bother in that movie and it felt a lot more natural and did feel earned in the way it was like structured the characters and the way they were interacting with the kind of main horror element um, I feel like that's a better example of how to pull that off. But overall, there was more I liked with that than that kind of caveat at the end. We got to be like, yeah, it's kind of silly they didn't do that. But I guess like in the real, I don't know, Jeffrey Dahmer story, the cops are incompetent and let all sorts of stuff go on. So <laughs> You're you right. Can, <laughs> you could, I suppose you could write it off in certain ways. And Damn. it was the, that the is 70s, an, I guess. That is an unfortunate thing to <laughs> think about <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eh, you know exactly. maybe some cops are just kind of shit and <laughs> these things happen because they're bad <laughs> yeah damn yeah. that jeffrey Dutt, yeah the fucking literally just lets him go away with his victim like eh, yeah it's disturbing you're probably it's gay really, really whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah look that up everybody <laughs> it's we're very bizarre very um upsetting, yeah. this came out the same year as texas chainsaw massacre which is also a very highly influential, very influential uh, yeah. horror film, which is kind of interesting. In quite different ways. They're like subtle different. in different ways. Yeah. But they're both experts at creating atmosphere and using, uh, yeah, like a unique spin on a on a certain setting or space. Because mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, is there the whole like sorority like frat culture in Canada or is that specifically an American thing? So I don't know. Been... Yeah. I don't know if this was supposed to be set in Canada. I know it's a Canadian film, but like there's, as soon as we're like, 
you know, we got the search party and vigilantes are running around outside with shotguns knocking on people's door. I'm like, this doesn't yeah. seem very Canadian. <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah, sure, at, what, at one point they're playing <laughs> hockey. That's about it. Like, I don't, where is this set? Where is this set? I don't know. So, um, I mean, like the frats and sororities, I think they do exist somewhere, maybe in Ontario. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Um, there's like campuses, like university campuses, where people. Yeah, well, there are campuses here, but there's more this whole subculture that yeah. I've never been able to understand of like the hazing and <laughs> yeah, the sorority houses and the frat houses yeah. and like the structure of it and how it like works. I'm a little bit confused by but uh all three of these movies are set in a sorority house or at least have it as a mm -hmm. the main place the action happens um and yeah that was another reason when when you recommended the film and i was reading the synopsis and being like oh maybe this is going to be a bit kind of more i don't know goofy or you know so many so many films or settings that take place in the frat house or the sorority you know they have a certain true <laughs> it comes with certain uh check marks that you'd imagine seeing but it it doesn't really ever feel like that in this one anyway it's you get it's a bit more of the it's kind of stuff in the sequel or the other ones it's kind of frustrating just because the the entire the the entire cultural conversation around horror movies at this point slasher movies you know what do, what do people think about we think of like schlock and so much of it really is yeah so like much Freddy of it really Jason fucking is and, yeah, like, yeah. Even, even if you look at films that are like considered to be like oh this is like a classic like friday the 13th <laughs> nowhere near mature as this film not even close <laughs> not even in the same fight it shouldn't even be the same genre to me you know um yeah and so there is this weird stigma that comes from horror movies admittedly because a lot of horror movies are really bad <laughs> um, yeah and most it, probably. Yeah. It, se it seems that you know people people have kind of missed the point <laughs> in my opinion where yeah. now it's just like okay over glorified gore you know sexualized uh weird it's almost it's almost like pornography in a way you know like and that that can yeah. be fun if it's self-aware about what it is and it's just like you know fuck we're doing it like we both enjoyed the new saw movie that movie knows mm -hmm. what it is to an extent um and is fun to watch ironically and ir unironically the fucking terrifier movies you know anytime they try to do story it's terrible but the fucking the gore and the practical effect like that's some insane yeah practical effects work that's some insane like that if you if you know what you're going into the movie for and you can appreciate certain elements of filmmaking you know like the the, the effects worth the, the effects work is very much a part of the filmmaking and damien mm -hmm. leone is very talented at that so there's nothing wrong with that enjoying it for that but like i just hate how most horror movies seem to be really fucking campy schlocky uh nonsense and uh i don't know you can argue like a24 is changing that a bit uh or at least the people the directors that are being distributed by a24 but yeah know. they just got lazy with it it's because uh, another thing with horror movies is that that keeps them popular is the fact that this they're, they're fairly cheap to make compared to a lot of other yeah big scope kind of projects and that's why you do see your blum houses and whatnot making just these awful horror films because you can just take the risk and spend five yeah. million dollars on black christmas 2019 and probably even make money back to be honest um so True. yeah the, the the bar is just so low and uh we've had just so many bad examples and yeah it's just kind of like a tired genre in a lot of ways like yeah with these halloween remakes with just anything like released after the cabin in the woods and like these le these like meta stories that like are making fun of and scream even is like <laughs> that's the whole point is like commentary on the genre and taking the tropes and spinning them on their head and trying to find other angles to approach the slasher genre because yeah you're right it's it's pretty tired at this point like what was the uh, like bodies 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 was quite good but again it's like a satire it's got a lot of different stuff it's playing yeah it's a bit more clever like and that kind of thing's a lot more rare, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, doing something new is a lot more rare <laughs> in any yeah. genre. But 
Um, even even Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which like I really love, um, yeah. feels a lot less yeah, mature <laughs> in many points of it uh, than uh, Black Christmas in terms of what type of movie they're going for, like how they present it, you know, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's that, that like shot of the cabin, but it's also like a butt shot. <laughs> Just, yeah, you know, yeah. it, the, the, there, there's the first half of Texas Chainsaw Massacre almost feels like, you know, kind of a shitty movie in many respects. Some of the acting and just like how it's shot and blah, 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 blah. And Texas Chainsaw, really very much redeems itself in the second half half by being just so balls to the wall intense and just like unrelenting and like holy shit her performance is so great and like just everything just magically comes together the entire second half of that movie is just incredible um and yeah. saves the whole thing for me um and i might even like texas chainsaw more than black christmas but black christmas is I a film I'd where it's more consistent throughout. Like it doesn't, I don't feel like, oh yeah, this half shit and this half's better. It's like a consistent piece of filmmaking where it builds upon itself and sure, like the stakes get higher and you might get more interested at certain points, but it's it's a very, you know, you're, you're, you're not uh, noticing like different levels of quality throughout the entire film in no. chunks. No, no, no. It, it seems so much more mature and more well realized and like they knew what they were filming before they started filming yeah and meticulous too because there's too much there's too much kind of coordination there's something more like in texas chainsaw it almost feels a bit more improvisational yeah how they're like stumbling into mm -hmm. these environments whereas like the there's so much intention to a lot of like the the camera work the, the different styles of uh presentation where yeah you are sh you are seeing the lead killers like pov like literally from his perspective you're seeing uh all the creepy like uh there's that great shot where the the camera just kind of glides through the the hallways going back to the entrance to the the loft and uh this yeah there's clearly just a lot of planning intention storyboarding that's that's gone down to achieve a lot of the imagery and memorable visuals they were going for and it definitely mm -hmm. paid off because <laughs> yeah that's, that's the mark of a good horror movie to me you need that that atmosphere and you need the the imagery to uh, pay off in some way and kind of strike you in ways you weren't anticipating or at least get under your skin and yeah i did feel uneasy and it felt like the characters were while they weren't always acting <laughs> In the smartest kind of way like no. there, there were often reasons for it but you know like they were all sorority girls they're often drinking in a lot of scenes um it gives them i don't know it gives it gives the story a certain level of believability i guess yeah and, uh, the characters feel like the they're, they're kind of real people uh which is a problem that gets more accentuated the more these films go on but uh, yeah we'll they that. weren't like all super fucking annoying people that i wanted to die immediately which is what yeah. I, what i'm now remembering about texas chainsaw massacre is just how fucking annoying everybody was at the beginning <laughs> i'm like you should die yeah you should die you know just <laughs> thinking, thinking that in my head and like yeah like i think that horror works better when you're scared of someone dying not when you're anticipating and just waiting for them like oh i i hope this guy gets killed you know that's such a common trope nowadays when the fuck did that start of like oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna take all these characters and make them assholes so that you feel good when they die because they deserve it or something like that seems to be horror movies approach yeah by so that many only works so many for me if there's movies. like a satire angle it's a huge or... trope commentary that like justifies it uh, yeah but yeah you're right most of the time it is just well we got nothing else going on so just we're not even gonna we're, we're not even gonna attempt to make you care about these characters because it's a lot easier just to it's better when you care people it's better when you care because then you don't better. want them to die and then it's like what's the intended emotion do you want me to feel horrified because if the genre horror wants me to feel horrified <laughs> i think that's a good thing <laughs> well you right? need to be able to project yourself onto at least like one character at least one perspective where you can kind of yeah insert yourself into a scary scene and be there with the character otherwise like if you're sat there just thinking oh i would never do that i would <laughs> i've never known anyone to behave this way and it just mm -hmm. feels like i'm watching a movie then you can't engage with the horror so yeah that's quite an essential element yeah this black black christmas is a little I would say it's like closer to Hitchcock 
than like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or yeah. a lot of other. It's, it doesn't. Films. It's not. Yeah, it's not presenting itself as if it is lower class or whatever. Like no. one of these throwaway, like Happy Death Day or something on that kind of level. You know. It's... Yeah, very sensible, very mature choices in this film. Everything comes together in a clear, consistent way. Um, was very impressed by it. I think pacing could probably be a little bit better. Um, there were some slow parts, but maybe I'll find it a bit more atmospheric on a second watch um, rather than slow at certain parts because there is just there's there is a lot that sticks with you about this movie. Um, I will be thinking about it. I won't immediately be forgetting about it like uh, fucking Aquaman and the Lost Memory. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd um, forgotten we'd even spoken about that. Exactly. What, what did we do today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the there is I I have to admit you say that there is like a level of believability and like yeah they're drinking or whatever it's like it's not just that you know she goes upstairs <laughs> after without a real plan and just a fire poker like sure that's dumb but that's like, the dumbest choice for the year. I don't e- even even in this you know if we're imagining that the police officers are the same in the what was it Ted Bundy or whoever the, I don't remember the guy's name. Um, even if we imagine those are the same police officers, they're not going to fucking leave her (laughs) in bed alone. (laughs) Like she should be in a hospital. First of all, second, they're not going to leave her like that. Like they're going to have somebody watching over her. Like they, they haven't even interrogated her yet. They're like, Oh, well she'll be fine. when (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, uh, that, that just seemed entirely unreasonable. So again, like, I, I guess, Maybe I can excuse that as being like, okay, this isn't a real narrative. This is like a just a nightmare logic sort of thing. I don't know if the film is that self aware. I yeah, think that I maybe just sure dumb that. things happen in horror movies sometimes. But um, damn, and the way it, the way that it kind of started even was the one guy. What what? I wrote this down. Oh yeah, he's in shock. I'm like, where were you the whole fucking like? We've seen you <laughs> once before. You didn't see any action. <laughs> you didn't mm-hmm. see. He's in shock just by like looking at a girl sleeping after a traumatic event. He's and then they're all like, "We got to help this guy." And then maybe they get him to a hospital and not her. Like that. That was weird. But maybe actually, now that I come to think about it, we could also interpret it in kind of a feminist angle of like, "Oh yeah, the men just leave her alone with like an abusive thing in the house." Um, because, mm. you know, we had the abortion conversation. We have the controlling boyfriend conversation. This is a very feminist movie. And also, uh, I spoke about horror movies being sexualized. This is the least... <laughs> this is the least, like, exploitative, sexualized horror movie involving all women, like, maybe ever. <laughs> Which is um, even crazier considering it was the 70s, you know, the 74. It's, yeah. It's not quite what you'd oh, expect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> An abortion would have been like a much more touchy conversation then, I assume. Well, yeah. Well, even going back to the uh, those scary phone calls, some of the language that is in there mm. would have been quite cutting edge, quite yeah, quite out there for seventy four. And I Intense. got those; they were scary and effective. Like I thought the the performance on those uh, the the VO for those phone calls and however they achieved that was quite like intense. Mm-hmm. It, it is scary scary audio and well-made audio um yeah when i heard that i was immediately thinking about like there's no way that you could even attempt to recreate this (laughs) just knowing that there's two remakes i'm like you can't do this this is this is the ideal version of this i know this already you can't do this better you know this this is the 70s nature also makes it like creepy exactly the 70s setting the analog horror nature of that it's just so much scarier than the internet being involved with phones being involved. Any of that at play does, yeah, just inherently hurt some of the setting. I'm getting yeah. scary texts. <laughs> yeah, we'll get we'll get onto that. In a bit, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Why don't we move on? Because unless you have more to say about it, we can talk more about this in the discussion of the other ones anyway. Yeah, I'm sure it will come up as we talk about the other two, but. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by this. I was, yeah, surprised by its tact, its reservation, its, uh, I don't know, it, it seemed to actually care about the atmosphere and trying to frighten you or create something unnerving and creepy and it, it never, like, blows its load too early or messes around too much. I, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed this. This would be a, 
if not for that kind of goofy way they got to that ending sequence, uh, might even be higher than a three and a half star, seven out of ten. But for now, everything in mind being that budget, that runtime, the seventy four setting, how kind of progressive it is for that, and where it stands in the history of slashes. So, yeah, I thought this was really solid and surprising. You know what? I'm gonna bump mine up to a seven. It was a it was nice. a hovering around uh, high six low seven. I'm like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. It's got enough going on. Yeah, yeah, it's I, interesting I mean, enough. You know, there's enough about it that, like, you know, after watching it, uh, what two days ago? Two days ago, um, that you know, there's there's things that stick with me more than Aquaman that I watched one day ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd happily watch this. Again. I could kind of tell, you know, watching this. Like, you know, there's there's things that I will remember about this in the future, and I will rewatch it. It's a it's a movie that um, I'll definitely revisit. There's a 4K Blu-ray. Why don't I fucking get that? I think I put it on my yeah. wish list. I'll buy it later. Um, yeah, seven out of ten. It's a shockingly good horror movie and just makes me upset at what horror movies are <laughs> I know, if this right? is if this yeah. is where we start this and texas chainsaw massacre is like start point everybody's like whoa we can in- get inspired so much and then yeah make a bunch of shit <laughs> a bunch of bullshit <laughs> I, I thought it was funny um last episode when you mentioned or last recording uh you mentioned you wanted to recommend black christmas or whatever and I mistakenly thought you were recommending like some like black exploitation movie or no. something because of the name. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and apparently that was like a fear that some of the distributors had for the movie too. Um, oh, of weird! It's more of like a a, fl- uh, a play on uh, yeah, White Christmas, obviously Black Christmas. And okay, it's a horror movie. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I thought so. The original title was not Black Christmas. It was. Uh, originally Silent titled Night, Silent Evil Night. Night, Evil Night in the United States, and then retitled Stranger in the House on television screenings, which is very odd. So I guess maybe the Canadian screenings, they retain the Black Christmas. I don't know. It just says in the United States it was different, so I, I have That's, no idea. Yeah, that is funny to think about. Very so, I do like that name. Yeah, I do. It is a good name. Something I forgot to mention about uh, LW's family. Mm. He has... he there's There was... There were two Vinnies, and at least one of them was his cousin. So he actually had a my <laughs> cousin. Vinny. Vin- he literally said, "This is my cousin Vinny," and then I didn't oh, say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th- I was thinking it. Um, that was cool. Oh man, they did the hand thing. Even, even the ones that like, like his sister doesn't even sound that Italian. But like, they were kind of having like fun little family arguments, and they were still doing the. <laughs> Doing the hand thing. Like, yeah. Uh, when I went to Italy a few months ago, like the hand thing was just everywhere. Yeah. Because oh, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just straight up real. <laughs> it rocks. That hand thing. <laughs> it's so expressive. Um, Black Christmas. <laughs> 2006. <laughs> oh. I have a history with this movie. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. Wait, so is this the only one of the three you'd already seen? Yes, but it doesn't matter because I didn't remember anything about it. Yeah, yeah. So it was like okay. I was experiencing it for the first time again. So I think I was 16 years old is my best guess. Um, yeah. And uh, I rated it a 1 out of 10 on IMDb <laughs> in like, what, 2007? Um, and all I remember about it, and I think I tried watching it more than once. I think it was one of those like I was just discovering <laughs> how unwatchable and bad a movie could be um <laughs> yeah and you know had that i maybe self-doubt of like maybe i just gotta watch it again or like maybe i was mm-hmm. like tired or something and then just yeah i i don't know if i finished it on both i think i remember i tried more than once i don't know if i actually finished it on either attempt <laughs> i think i tried skipping around on the dvd to see like when mary elizabeth winstead dies because i was like well she was in final destination three mm-hmm. um and uh, I think I remember not finding that part and giving up because <laughs> <laughs> brief, now, yeah. now watching the movie, we don't even know if she died, really. That could have been someone else's blood. This was so much more what I was expecting from that original movie. So it's like everything, everything, it's like all the inverse. 
How could Decis- you expect anything decisions. like this? This. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> this is this is like. How do you you say more of what you're expecting? This is this is like a very uniquely bad film. This is like this is not even in the like oh it's a horror movie like oh it's so tropey like this isn't even just bad Friday the Thirteenth sequel this is like incompetent levels of incompetency. Oh, it's definitely incompetent, but I just mean more the like just bad slasher. Schlock. You know, like you, you just you turn on the TV at like two in the morning mm. in the and it, this is the kind of thing that's going to be on there on like just yeah some garbage horror channel or whatever. Um, that's more what I mean by it. But I wasn't. I don't know. It's it is extremely bad, but I wasn't mad. I was kind of entertained by a lot of this this dumbass film. Um, I, I yeah, I, I wasn't bored. It's like so short, an hour wow. and twenty minutes long. It it messes the whole thing up. But I don't know. It's it it kind of funny to me, uh, <laughs> just how much they did fumble that back. Um, it was fascinating. I wish that that fascination was consistent throughout the entire film because I was definitely bored in the middle chunk. I wish I could what, have been what, entertained the entire yeah, time. <laughs> yeah, I get that. But it was more the... And the inverse nature of from that 70s one where there is something so reserved about it and a lot of the like violence is a bit more obscured or implied or just a bit smarter. It's a complete opposite. This is like complete schlock. You know, like you see all the silly gore, like... I guess spoilers, but like, you know, falling on like Christmas, being impaled on Christmas trees and all this like ridiculous stuff that you're seeing. Um, it's a complete op- inverse approach and yeah, never has any tension, never has any anything you actually want from a, a good horror film. Um, but there was, there was some kind of interesting stuff there to me, like the... It's just like a weird project for this guy, the director, Glenn Morgan, who, who if you look up, he's like, he like wrote that the X Files, like a bunch of episodes, and he has some stuff on there that's like, oh, so it's not like you were just handed this for no reason. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't, it, it didn't wind up working out. But there's there's something there. Like he wrote the screenplay for the first Final Destination, which is a pretty fun horror film. Some good stuff in there. But yeah, I'd, uh, the the time gap too, as well. Like from seventy four yeah. to two thousand and six, it's a uh, Multiple generations have passed. It's a completely different style. And yeah, the, the whole genre is completely different and it's way more just, yeah, but this is the bargain bucket type thing. This is, this is what would be in the, the dollar bucket of like, oh, those horror movies, you know. The Walmart <laughs> films. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I find, it, I find it interesting that there were no sequels. For like thirty years. That, yeah, that is weird for it, there to be three remakes of one film from the seventies and them never to have considered to do a sequel because that it's not like that first movie wasn't a financial success. In fact, that was part of it that it was made on the shoestring budget and actually managed to make a fair amount of money, like five times its budget or so. Uh, which, which is yeah, in any instance you'd consider a success. So why they just left it, I'm not sure. I guess it's because it was the seventies and the whole grinding out sequels thing just wasn't expected or anticipated in the exact same kind of way you know i, I mean we we saw how many sequels existed for texas chainsaw massacre there's like fucking like five of them or some shit yeah what's the difference there then why does texas Ch- is it just because it's much more popular and there's a there's a figurehead that was that was another thing of the reservation of the black christmas uh like the main villain, because you never see him and he stays obscured, that means there's not something that can be put on a poster or oh, yeah. sold in a shop, like a mask there's, or a, yeah. an image to encapsulate it. We want to so, see more Leatherface. Exactly, yeah. So they can't really do that in the same world. And that's one of the kind of trappings it falls into in the 2006 version, where it's like, you know, in the Texas Chainsaw sequels, where they try to flesh out the backstory and give the perspective of the the villain in some way or explain how he is the way he is. And there are multiple flashback scenes in the 2006 black Christmas going into the, the Billy character who is, yeah, they, they, they basically diffuse and, uh, all of the, the tension of the, the mystery from that first movie of like, Oh, who is it? Like, what is, 
this who or what is this person like in the house like living in the walls it's How billy there? What is he? <laughs> no it's billy like it's it opens like, like in, a, in a in an asylum and it's like oh this this is the guy right here it's never a question it's like no this is him this he is tries more to break of a... out of here every christmas <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the, we're gonna let him does it so stupid oh yeah i'm gonna leave the door wide open and get on my hands and knees while this guy that tries to break out of here every christmas is <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. he doesn't even look he doesn't even react to like him getting stabbed he looks like well you got me he doesn't even react like, like he looks like he's gonna die he looks like just kind of pissed yeah and then th- the other thing i mentioned in the 70s version that uh, like the crux of that tension being uh you you are aware as an audience member that the there is something in the house that the main characters don't know whereas in this version all the characters in the house like know who billy is and they're like oh billy lived here he's home and it's like oh see so you know he's around so this is this really is just a standard like <laughs> guy escaped from the insane asylum and is killing people although it's not <laughs> there's a line where i got really confused because they say but they can't be billy billy's dead i'm like why would they think he's dead is it not like yeah, public information that, that he's in the th- what that's hmm? never expanded on yeah, yeah why did that why was that line there what, what did they mean by that <laughs> yeah <I have> no <laughs> what <sighs> apparently there are a bunch of uh like reshoots and uh the director and the the Weinsteins uh, could not oh. agree on a tone or, I guess, a story. <laughs> so that might be the remnant of something. You never know. Like, I don't know exactly w- which parts of the movie are Glenn Morgan and which parts are just reshoot Glenn Morgan. Um, yeah. But it seemed to be like a production hell kind of thing. I look at this film and I'm not sure I can, you know, uh, Chris Stuckman thinks that this is uh, like a uh, doesn't deserve the hate thing. And he gives Glenn Morgan a lot of like leeway. And, you know, um, he he seems to be of the mind where it's like, oh, yeah, like probably all the bad stuff is from Harvey Weinstein. I don't know if I can give this movie that much <laughs> leeway. Uh, it seems like it, it's it's pretty fucking rotten to the core. Um, yeah, it seems it seems unsalvageable. Like I sure there's like there's a split diopter shot you know there's some low angles but even as i'm watching the film i'm I'm like okay there is cinematography here but how is it motivated right like but for what purpose is the cinematography different in this movie for what purpose Mm -hmm. right and i could never find any kind of like good answer it was just like oh here's a low angle like okay yeah and it's like the the hyper fixation almost on uh, the, the eye shot from the first film and like yeah let's just do that but now, now let's do it 20 times oh yeah through, just, let's just keep doing it again <laughs> again through a again. peephole the size of a fucking thumbtack puncture <laughs> yeah yeah how are you gonna see shit how are you gonna see shit out of that that doesn't make any that sense was the, that was the only thing i kind of liked was the the goofiness of uh I don't know, this guy just, like, living in the walls. Like, oh, yeah. Taking that to the next Crawling level. Around. He's actually just, like, crawling through the walls and, like, making little peepholes and all this kind of stuff. That's kind of a funny way to expand it. And, of course, the twist of there being multiple killers this time. So there's the two people crawling around the house. And there was there's a moment where the character is trapped in the walls and she's screaming for help. And they're kind of, like, trying to get down to her. Where it's, like, thinking, oh, that's kind of a cool idea. There's, man, if this could have just been... I don't know, re- rewritten, re- <laughs> if these ideas could have been focused in a different way, there could have been some something cool here, something interesting. But yeah. yeah it, it, it can't commit to like a tone to the story it wants to tell. They completely remove the procedural element that was in that 70s version, and it is more of like, a, yeah, let's flesh out Billy for some reason. Like, why? Like, yeah. <laughs> so He's- they can show off more gore, I guess, so he can watch his... Uh, father get beaten to death with a hammer, and you can like see all the, all the goo and the gunge and the yeah, he's I don't pulling understand. out people's eyes and eating them, and it's just focus on the eyes. It's like they thought yeah. it would be disturbing in of itself if like he came from a jaundiced family, and everyone's yellow, <laughs> yeah. and there was incest, and it's like oh, I've such such a disturbing backstory. It's like I, I don't know, I, I guess like it was inspired by other movies, like the Texas Chainsaw or something, like. 
oh, the family is so yeah, fucked the hills up. Have eyes and, yeah. It's such a bad family. It's like, it doesn't really add anything. <laughs> I don't care. It just seems like padding. It's like, oh, just get back to these people. And what, what I found to be particularly frustrating about this movie is like, there's a lot of horror movies where I'm like, ah, oh, just get on with it. Just, just kill them, right? Just kill them. Just show me the deaths. Yeah. In this one, I, I found myself almost thinking that, but then remembering none of the deaths are fun. <laughs> so I don't even know if you wa- I want to see the deaths. I just want the movie to end. Like, none of the deaths are fun. They're not, like, cool or interesting. Like, one of them was so kind of like, gory, like, like the any eyeball of them. one. I, yeah, there, there were a couple of moments that that was really the only thing that was keeping me going was, like, when there was a death scene and they did something so, like, silly or ridiculous or over the top or <laughs> campy like when the mary elizabeth winstead in the car like exploding into blood and then the older lady, <laughs> like which part like, of her exploded? getting impaled <laughs> what happened yeah i thought that was, was hilarious the guy in the back? did she spontaneously do that or was the killer somewhere else <laughs> did that just happen to her is that what like what think, jfk's head or whatever they like, were doing that happened. cliche where i guess he was hiding in the back seat or something but it's, we never like, see make it. any sense like we don't even I know guess... if it was her blood we don't even know if she died <laughs> yeah, maybe that was just him like vomiting blood on the screen. I, that was uh, like a squirrel who, knows? who ate too they... <laughs> many uh, Mentos and Coke. <laughs> but then that scene ending with the the icicle falling down. Oh yeah, like, she, like, she just like died incidentally. <laughs> yeah, like she that wasn't even the, the killer didn't even kill her. <laughs> and <laughs> then just, like I don't she know. just had a. a an unrelated accident. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like hilarious, <laughs> and and the whole. There's this ongoing thing where he has this obsession with eyes, Billy, and he's like pulling out people's eyes, and there are a, f- a few fun shots of him doing that, like popping someone's eye out. Like the the first victim is quite like a brutal scene where it's like the equivalent kill from the poster of the seventies one. Uh, are you sure that's not the second? Like, oh yeah, you might be right actually. Because they did yeah. two in a row of the fucking bag over the head, <laughs> and the second yeah, one they right. pulled, there were there were eye eye holes cut already <laughs> and he just, just put it on her being, perfectly. There were a few <laughs> moments where eyes come out and there's like the full cartoon like like thing um, mm-hmm. like popping out uh, which was funny to me and then the, the quote unquote kind of payoff at the end where in the the attic equivalent space there's like a Christmas tree with like eyes hung on it and <laughs> all this kind of silliness uh, that was kind of funny to me and then in like Falling on the tree at the end and being impaled. So this is so stupid. And making the meat cookies. It's like so over the top and ridiculous. Oh yeah, it's like those things that, aren't that, that was kind sharp. of entertaining. What the hell? You, <laughs> you yeah, could just yeah, use yeah. a knife. Like what the fuck? What did you do? <laughs> yeah. So many it's bizarre, bad decisions. It just feels like nothing about it could have possibly come together in any way. All of the acting is atrocious. None of the oh, characters yeah, really do anything right. interesting. They're not defined in any particular way. One of them is just like, oh, I'm drinking, and that's it. We don't know why she's drinking. Did I ever explain that? Is she, like, mm-hmm. stressed out about something, or is she just, like, the worst alcoholic ever? Just she drinks her... Like, she's going to kill herself before the killer even gets her. Right? She's, like, <laughs> halfway to alcohol poisoning <laughs> before the killer even shows up. Um, yeah, I figured that was them just trying to do the the Margot Kidder character yeah the original mrs mac or whatever like oh there's one person loves alcohol it's like well okay well it was funny in the original it didn't take away from anything in the original despite it being funny in this one it's just confusing like oh why is she doing this okay i guess she's throwing up like is this she's not a likable character she's not a a you know endearing character she's just another random hot girl which Mm -hmm. seemed to be the entire casting of this movie was just hot girls it was like i was watching fucking saw six or some shit right like (laughs) yeah and then and then like i don't know for you to call this black christmas ostensibly they watched the first movie right like was there a a point to the, the the this being so sexualized also like it's not inherently wrong for things to be sexualized. You know, I'm not like one of those, you know, anti-sex people, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just seems weird in a movie that was already, you know, from the get-go, the first film, a pretty uniquely feminist, non-sexualized horror movie. Uh, it feels weird for all of a sudden every casting choice to be like, okay, looks over acting, first of all. And then... Yeah. fucking pervy uh shots like ooh he's he's not only uh hiding 
underneath the tiles, but he's getting a good look at that ass. <laughs> like, like a are those the yeah. Harvey Weinstein reshoots? Is that like, I don't know. Do we blame Christ, him for that? Yeah. You never and know. It's just the film takes much more enjoyment in like the kills and the excess of that. And like, yeah. Yeah, you're right. yeah there's something that subtlety. there's something weirdly sexual about the whole uh you know like killing girls in a violent <laughs> gratuitous way because it's always yeah. hot girls right and so uh-huh. like, we're gonna like pop you we're gonna pop you and get all the blood and we're gonna make a squishy noise yeah, yeah. and again though like some another thing the 70s one gets right is there is the threat of these kind of concepts like the stuff that is being said over the phone it's it's going to these places and it is creepy but it's also left to the imagination is the difference you know mm-hmm. you know you're not really seeing these things when they actually play out because when they do play out in the 2006 version it's it's just goofy as hell or it does feel like more exploitative or yeah more just standard cliche horror you know like yeah of course you have the the hot girls being taken out one by one and yeah there's this underlying kind of sexual element to it all um yeah what i found interesting about the first movie is you know there's points where we have to imagine that he's not inside the house you know do did he kill the child we don't know he definitely it seems like he probably killed the police officer in the car outside um whereas this movie is just no he's he's like in the walls he just likes being in the walls um and it's yeah, that's the right. least, least that structurally killing. intact house of all time. Yeah, that's just another example of the reserved nature of that earlier movie, just being willing to be like, yeah, it stays scary by leaving it open, by yeah. leaving the question open. We don't know who killed answering. the child. Answers enough. Was it related? Like, you understand what's going on, but yeah, was it related? Was it what was going on? And it gives like a good excuse for why there's a paranoia in the town and why people want to be locked up in their house and not leave. Um yeah the least structurally intact house of all time in this 2006 film (laughs) yeah people people are just like fucking throwing themselves through walls (laughs) and he's like popping out the tiles from underneath there's no glue holding those tiles together they just they just come (laughs) up like they're just coins on the floor you know you just pop (laughs) that was kind of a that, that was a moment i did kind of like was the the pin being pushed out from that's the, weird like, inside it. <laughs> that was weird yeah that was like oh this is kind of like weird and freaky but he's everywhere again he's everywhere really in your walls go anywhere yeah and it has like, just like stupid stuff like the what's he called was it billy billy yeah billy billy um he like lifts the the grown man by his head with like a bin bag towards the end and then locks him in the loft and kills him and it's just like this is so goofy. The, even the sound effects are goofy. Like I didn't mention it in the seventies one, but there's. A, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before. There's that just that that that, that door sound effect that like every film uses. Yeah, it was in the seventies one and the two thousand and six one, like multiple times. I just kept hearing that goddamn door sound yeah. effect, like the door hinge. <laughs> so that's definitely like a me thing, but can't not hear it now. Um, I didn't hear it in the seventies one, but I definitely heard one in the two thousand six one. So like, is there only is there only one recording of a door hinge like ever or something? I like, guess why? so. <laughs> it's just well, a, it's it's a thing it's where it's like, like if nobody thing, notices like, it, people will just keep using it. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's in the, you know, they they already have a license for it. You don't have to pay a foley artist. It's just in the st- it's that's what stock sounds are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's for and before, that. Before like VHSs and DVDs, I guess you couldn't have the option to like rewatch things a million, million, million times and like overanalyze every single sound and frame. Um, yeah, quite like we can now. So I get it from that perspective. But yeah, just the 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 sound is just such a downgrade from that. Oh hell version. yeah. I, just the sound design in this this film is just fucking atrocious. The mixing, <laughs> I kept having to adjust my volume. I hate yeah, that. Yeah, that was bad. Everybody hates yeah. that. Stop doing that. <laughs> Nobody likes that. <laughs> like, oh, it's going to be scarier because it's louder at this point. Louder is equal scarier. So we have to make the rest of the movie quiet so that you turn up the volume and then it's louder. Blah, 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 blah. Also, sound design choices. I mentioned in the 70s film, um the choice to have the uh christmas choir music being played the first phone call in this film they play the stock well not technically stock but 
just low quality, badly composed, might as well be stock horror, scary music of like, oh, yeah. like droning, kind of like, oh, you can tell in the background it's supposed to be scary. You're supposed to be scared right now. It's creepy and sinister. Right. They do that. They ruin the effect or anything that could be coming out of that phone scene. Just absolutely ruined in post. Mm. And another thing they ruin in post twice in this movie um, they have that uh, snow globe with the chime music, the whatever. I don't know if it's Nutcracker theme, whatever. They have some Christmassy yeah. kind of like chime being played. And the noise is like beckoning another character into the attic. They hear it in the attic. They're like, what is that? And they follow the music, but they can't just play the music in this film. They have this urge to also play scary music score underneath. So you have two songs playing at once. You can't like like if you just removed that 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 extra score of like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you removed that it would be so much more atmospheric but they rob us of any potential experience <laughs> they yeah. rob us they won't even let us begin to think that something is scary or atmospheric no you can't tell what's in the environment of this place like even yeah. even you looking back to the seventies film the the music that I'm praising that for in that scene. That was diegetic. That was like yeah. that was music being played in their house. Like that's cool. It brings us into what the environment must have been like for those characters, and it makes it feel more real and grounded. But in this 2006 film, it's like, no, it's a movie. Let's remind you that it's a movie. We won't even let you hear what the characters hearing. We're gonna play this other shit over top. Go fuck I also yourselves. liked in the in the 70s one how the the boyfriend character was a piano player, and there was like an ongoing mm -hmm. uh, kind of creepy use of piano notes. And there was something I read about the the composer using like a that's a technique I think like Hans Zimmer used in the Dark Knight score by putting like blades or something weird on piano wires or guitar wires. And you can just get these unsettling weird noises, and they do that a bunch in the 70s one. And there's there's really nothing. There's nothing like that in the sequels at all. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in the the audio visual experience. Like the 2006 one, all it cares about is the the killing hot babes thing. I guess that's kind of it. That's the main crux. Hell yeah, it's like goofy. Yeah. yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Them hot babes are gonna die, and I'm gonna jerk to it. I guess like is that what I'm supposed to feel? I'm like, I don't know. And more of a, yeah, it's way more goofy. Like the whole. When, when that character in an unearned way is like, Merry Christmas, motherfucker, in like kind of a hero <laughs> type thing. It's like, what? What? That's your... <laughs> First of all, it's like a lame, bad line. <laughs> and then it just... It's not even the, the end of the... That like crescendo, that action sequence. Like it just keeps going. So, like, oh, like, why'd you, why'd you put it there? <laughs> that whole thing with the morgue was really, really stupid. Oh, that was hilarious. That was, that was maybe the yeah. best part. <laughs> it's so so goofy by that point like you've seen it all at that by that stage in the story like there's nothing really dumber you could even imagine them pulling out of their hat but they go there like the two the two killers in the body bags and they're just like alive and no one notices like no one no one they cared, survived i guess they both they're survived just, both they killers. survived <laughs> in the body bags <laughs> yeah and, and they then just they start climbing out. in the walls again. Like it's just it's so. They're stupid. little gremlins. Like it's, <laughs> yeah, they're little trolls. <laughs> and I guess it was supposed to be a twist that there's like two killers. Like, oh, that's scary. Yeah, that was the like. Yeah, that's what was up this movie's sleeve. There are two um, this time. Yeah, I forgot to mention about the soundtrack. A lot of it was like really obviously just like keyboard soundtrack, like not real orchestra, like like shitty yeah. fucking sampled tuba and <laughs> trombone and like. God, like the the soundtrack for this film was just absolutely fucking just uh oh stinky. Um, <laughs> and I also should mention about the weird the it, it's maybe the worst edited film of like the decade. I don't know. Like there's no <laughs> there's no it's like partially editing and then partially also just like the cinematography and the storyboarding and like the intent from the director because he filmed so many shots. It's one of those just like we'll figure out in post sort of uh, sh shoots uh, where there's no patience for anything. And it's constantly cutting between different things with, with no room to breathe. And yeah, and the 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 mature nature of the original 70s film, it allowed you to get into the atmosphere. It allowed you to get scared 
because it was atmospheric and slow and and you feel what's in the environment you feel what's happening in that that universe this mm. it's just constantly like cut 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 this is a movie music music cut cut cut, cut. fake trombone bam 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 hot girl hot girl stupid thing <laughs> like it's just the, it's it's an absolute bombardment of terrible filmmaking and just a, a terrible structure of like the the entire mm. the entire project coming together is just so fucking unsalvageable and it's like nobody knew what they were making <laughs> nobody had an intent and j- just just like you were mentioning with like some of these other slasher horror movies of like you know did they have an idea of what they wanted to do on set before they filmed it i don't know mm. <laughs> i don't know i was asking myself whether or not this was supposed to be scary at different points in the movie i'm like is this supposed to be partially a comedy i don't see the genre listed there I don't see it listed on IMDb or Wikipedia. Yeah, like, when I don't it see attempted comedy, that seemed more like a kind of pathetic attempt to balance like that original movie to have like the comedic elements to have like they they saw the original was like oh that's that's something we have to get in there as like some some earnest attempts at comedy, and but it just completely falls flat. This, yeah, it's, the the places they choose to put their focus on are very strange. Like they really felt the need to justify in the script a lot more and try to explain why the characters are trapped in the house as well it's like that's not remember. really a concern in the first movie <laughs> like, yeah, a this time there's a storm and, <laughs> and the phones are out and nothing's oh. working and all this kind of stuff it's like oh so the nine one one is busy because of the storm yeah exactly every the storm yeah. is affecting everybody really badly right now um yeah every fucking there's like a million Chekhov's moments in this film mm. And they're all used within like seconds of them appearing. <laughs> yeah, like literally yeah. the opening, the opening fucking sequence, the opening death. I'm like, oh, it's kind of interesting that they showed a close shot of her setting down the pen. I wonder what the pen is going to be used for very quickly. Oh, she gets stabbed in the head by a pen, right? Yeah. Like it's just, there's constantly just setting things up very explicitly and obviously only to be set up. Which is, which is just dumb filmmaking. <laughs> it's just dumb. Like, stop doing that. You, you, yeah, <sighs> they do. They do like a whole emphasis on the fire prodder as well. Like, it's like the the camera lingers on it. It's like, oh, oh. that's definitely going to be in someone's eye. Pay attention <laughs> for this later in the film. Yeah, <laughs> you're a child. <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially what they're saying. Um, yeah, the 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 structural integrity of the house. Everything felt like it was made out of paper mache, including every character's head. They kind of just exploded spontaneously. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what the fu- I, what is this trying to be? I'm ge- I'm genuinely confused if it's like trying to be a comedy or not. And that shouldn't I shouldn't be so confused as to what emotion that a film is trying to make me feel. <laughs> that sucks. That does. When suck. I don't even understand the intent. And it's not like I don't know. It's got a nine million dollar budget. This one, quite Ouch. a quite a difference from that seventies one for a start. Um, and made twenty one million worldwide. So it's not, not not quite five times the budget this time, but uh, I guess enough to justify another remake a decade later. But uh, nine million. This does not seem like a nine million dollar budget movie to me. Uh, <laughs> probably all gone to the, those actors for the most part because uh I, I don't really see it in the film otherwise yeah maybe this, some gore stuff it's just, yeah i don't know what the fu- I, w- this is just absolute fucking garbage and uh apparently i was correct about this at the age of 16 <laughs> my opinion has not changed <laughs> my rating has not changed it is a one <laughs> it is a one out of ten you cannot get much worse than this for making a film uh if the goal of this movie was to make a movie they did a pretty fucking bad job yeah this this doesn't really really resemble movies let alone a horror movie (laughs) this really reminds me of the uh the cube trilogy discussion yeah we're like yeah hypercube following up and just just doing everything inversely wrong um but i guess where i differ is i just find i find when it goes this wrong to just be a bit more memorable and uh Mm -hmm. Especially before I knew, I don't know, the 2019 one kind of just changes things for me. Uh, <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd put it slightly higher than you. This would either be an extremely low two star or four out of ten or a one and a half star, or three out of ten. Um, wow. Yeah. Very generous. This, 
there's at least some things I can remember about it. There's some imagery, uh, a couple of fun gore moments that are like, yeah, I liked this more than like FNAF or uh, <laughs> some of the recent wow. like Blumhouse or like, I'm serious. Yeah, I was more entertained by it. Uh, because it, there's, there's just like that middling level so many horror films can be where I, I just, man, I was bored by the time it was like at the morgue, but <laughs> I, like, I, I don't know. It's, it's so short. This is so, it's so nothingy. I, uh, at I was, least it was, wasn't two hours. You're right. At least it at wasn't least two it hours. Wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the fuck, the blueprint was there. You'd had the same title and then it like, what 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 did you what did you get out of the first movie if this is what if this is what your interpretation is if this is if this is you improving it even if this is you thinking oh i'm gonna do it different and here's yeah why. and that's what's weird is like it's not like it is as famous as a texas chainsaw or, or a halloween or whatever it's no. not like the name recognition alone is like no, gonna get butts and seats. so why did you even call it black christmas why did you do that you could have just yeah. made something else like it might as well be yeah the phone call starts so late in the movie. We got like maybe one POV shot from the killer, and that was twenty eight yeah. minutes through the movie. <laughs> I it was, it was like wasn't it, it wasn't anything. It just yeah. immediately cut away. It was nothing. What were they doing? Mm-hmm. What were they trying to do? I don't fucking know. The movie's a piece of shit. Garbage. <laughs> Absolute garbage. Deserves all the hate <laughs> and more. Uh, one out of ten. Uh, all right. Uh, now it's time to talk about. Black Christmas. Yes, finally. 2019. Thank God. Um, <laughs> this time. Fuck this film. Fuck this film. <laughs> I this hate, time I it's political. <laughs> I hate this film, man. Great. I was... I was Let me hear oh, it. Oh, my God. That, that first act, I was like... If not for the podcast, I would have turned it off. I was like so... Wow, really? I was getting mad. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was pissing me off. It was making me mad. Is it because you hate women? Yes. Okay. The end. (laughs) Just end the episode. (laughs) No, because it is, it is crazy. I guess I'll start with, there's, there's a piece of trivia on the seventies one that I screenshot that kind of just like summarizes the whole thing and adds to the ultimate irony of this with the, this, a strict rule that Clark, the director had set for himself of the original one, sorry when it came to writing the female characters, was to never objectify them sexually or give them nude scenes. He wanted the college girls to come off as real people and not disposable horror characters waiting to die. Whereas, like, when the characters were dying in the 2019 version, I was cheering. I hate these people. I, They're all very obnoxious. I, 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 they are obnoxious. They are unlikable. They are all over the place. They don't feel like real people. It's the thing that has been coming up more and more, again, recently, where just every character feels like the writer, and it's just... There's no subtlety. If if there's one word to summarize that 74 version, it is subtle. It is like reserved. Yes. That is not what this movie is. Like no. uh, when I got to the end and then like looked at the listing on IMDb and was like, oh my God, what? It was PG 13 as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's literally, it's a slasher film. It's a slasher. They love doing that. It's a slasher film <laughs> without the slashing. There's no slashing in the film. True. <laughs> There's no gore in the film. Nobody got slashed, like, really. If if the 2006 <laughs> one was confused as far as like what it was trying to say and what it was trying to communicate, what the hell is this one trying to do? Because yeah, you made the political joke, and yeah, you could say the 70s one was political, but it was like the 70s is one is a too. is a feminist film. It's yes. a feminist film. It's a but really it's... good feminist film. <laughs> it's a feminist horror movie. This one is but... like. <laughs> What do we what do we fucking call this? <laughs> like detached it's... from reality Tumblr fucking like pretend <laughs> white feminism like never experienced a bad day in her life privileged version of feminism movie it like fucking me like of... not understanding what reality is at all. Yeah. It like, reminded me of that 13 Reasons Why style of writing where it's not about characters. It's not about a story. It's not about a plot. It's about starting with like a list of like talking points almost and just structuring oh, yeah. it around that. Nothing else matters. This film doesn't care about the fact that it's a horror film. It's not yeah. interested in the horror. It's For not f- interested in the tension. It's not interested in the atmosphere. None yeah. of the things that make horror good does this film care about. So then you ask yourself, so what is it trying to do? Is it trying to be like a satire? Is it trying to do like a scream type thing and critique these ideas or deconstruct it in some way? No, it's not doing that either. 
Like, what what is it doing? It's trying to be this, like, commentary on the frat culture and this essay stuff. Yeah, she Mate. thinks she's Jordan Peele or some shit. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. She thinks she's Chantal Ackerman. <laughs> and then when you read that, it feels like a, like a Jason Blum, like, guilt trip movie. Like, he was guilt tripped into making this because there was something about him like he, he made some statement about how there was some some drama about there were no there were no female directors in the blumhouse staple of movies oh oh god and he made some That's he made some clumsy <laughs> he made a clumsy statement about it and then shortly after chose the director of this movie that's to fucking hilarious and write it so it's that's like, really funny <laughs> even the motivation from the beginning is messed up like you didn't care about this being linked to the original one at all. No, it's an, it's, doesn't need to have. It's the more same like title. it's more like Hot Fuzz than it is Black Christmas. Yeah, um, it is. It's it's there's nothing that links it to that original, and it's even more inept to me than the 2006 one with what it does. Like what what is anything that get this film gets right? Because you know, even in the 2006 one, there were like moments I was listing off. There were like little bits of gore here and there, or parts where it was so so bad that it was kind of funny. When does that happen here? I th it's, I it's, thought this movie was very funny. I thought this I thought this was so bad that it was kind of funny. I I enjoyed it very much for that actually. Really? I also here here I'll I'll give you this. Um, this movie had a little bit more room to breathe and wasn't as ADHD Lee edited, you know, this movie, this movie, but it was boring. Also, oh, <laughs> no, well, it was annoying. I would say it was more annoying than boring. We have a little bit of the opposite reactions here. This is, mm, this is another hypercube situation actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Cause I was, I was annoyed by this, but I was, I was very engaged with how annoyed <laughs> I was at it. <laughs> and I found it very funny and I was like, okay, this is like a character study of a director, right? It's like a Neil Breen type <laughs> film where I'm like, I'm learning right. about the person that made this by watching their big piece of shit. Um, <laughs> and, and it's fucking fascinating. You, you think like, you know, there's the trope as you mentioned of like, unlikable characters in horror films what makes this one stand out is that it's from the perspective of the director who seemingly thinks that these are like good people <laughs> who seemingly That's thinks the characters are not annoying right in every other fucking movie where it's like annoying characters are supposed to die it, the director knows that they're annoying the writer knows that they're annoying they're setting them up to be annoying so that you feel like you, you feel like oh hell yeah they're finally dead like oh, yeah, blah, 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 like terrible people the director the, the, the perspective of this film doesn't know that they're terrible people <laughs> Right, which yeah. I find very That's fascinating. So wacky it's like that you're in a you're insane. in a fucking bubble. You're in a you're in absolute bubble. <laughs> Completely, you don't know what the it's, real world is. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like there's there's no part where you're with these characters or they even feel like characters. It feels like, oh man, it is like Thirteen Reasons Why. Or, very uh, much. I thought of it's nowhere near. Uh, on this level, but like promising young woman or something like this, mm -hmm. um, that's a lot better than this. But uh, it's a better kind of deconstruction of those kind of ideas. Uh, but man, it's not like we don't have examples of like good uh, takedowns or at least discussions or explorations of stuff like cancel culture in Tar or Succession. True. Uh, you have the essay stuff that's in The Boys or. Uh, the the more satirical angle of something like I mentioned earlier, bodies, 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 and that mm -hmm. that whole True. Kind of commentary and having the the more contemporary angle and modernizing something and bringing it into a yeah a contemporary setting. Whereas this, I guess we could talk about the like texting calling thing now. That's like an angle of it. That's where the where it starts instead of the scary calls. It's more like text. I got a scary text. Scary text. Oh, I got a scary <laughs> text too. <laughs> Great. That's fun. <laughs> That's frightening for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> That's visceral. <laughs> Especially considering the starting point, the 1970s film. <laughs> this just makes it so much worse. Yeah. Like, oh, is that what they're trying to do? Is this the obligatory, like, oh, we got a scary phone call, but it's like, but I just... it's 2019. <laughs> I feel like wh where it kind of where it kind of crosses the line for me I got, is that is that main character and her arc and like what I feel like they unintentionally wind up saying with the way they try to explore it because like she is a I guess a victim of SA mm -hmm. and the the culprit was like a frat boy um and there's this whole dynamic of her like trying to empower herself and 
take some kind of agency back in this situation. Mm -hmm. But the way it's like kind of explored and talked about with this like fr main friend group and especially like one or two main characters where they basically kind of boil it down to you didn't fight hard enough and you've just got to fight hard. Fight harder. Let's boil down this complex stuff into an army of boys running at an army of girls and they have a big fight scene in a hall dressed like wizards. Yeah, because they're a like secret whole, society and they actually just want to control all women and the ones who are not subservient, they kill. And that's the commentary. And... <laughs> but it's and, like and and it is all men because <laughs> if you say if you say it's not then she goes did you just say not all men did you just not all men me did you just not all men me as she's like aggressively pushing him <laughs> out the door as he's like not even doing anything and it's like what yeah. jesus is this a protagonist like what what kind of fucked up lens do you do you view this through like this is a crazy person who made this movie yeah, like, it's crazy that she exactly doesn't understand. How it feels. And it's like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> it's and lack it feels of empathy like <laughs> in your attempt to try and be like ahead of the curve and I guess progressive. It's, it's almost oh, yeah. like the opposite in a way, and it winds up kind of being <laughs> like the inverse and kind of like <laughs> like genuinely kind of offensive in ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was really quite. I was really struggling for that first part until. So, I was like, I, I really might have to turn this off. This is like pissing me off so much. Like I'm, I'm so just frustrated by by everything to do with this. Thinking this was a good idea, how they're how they're approaching the subject matter. No, the, just the lack of subtlety. You know, yeah. it's it's it's, it's just so fucking obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the most stop preaching, movie. man. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it is. It's preachy. It's unlikable, and it could have been satirical, but they like chose not to. Like, w w did they think she they were being incapable. funny and, like, they were hoping for more of a, like, as they're saying, the, like, snarky, preachy lines that people would be like, yeah, hell yeah. Like, the audience would be cheering it in that regard. But it's like, you know how in, um, uh, oh, man, why am I blanking on its name? The, the, Barbie. Damien Cazelle, <laughs> uh, nah, not Barbie, the, fuck. Sorry, Sound Damien Cazelle, uh. Sound of Freedom. Um, oh, that's what I was trying to get at. Sound uh, of Freedom. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was trying to remember Sound of Freedom because, like, it, there's it's almost like a weird inverse version of that film. Oh like yeah, in the complete opposite. Oh yeah, way. I I actually mentioned this in my fucking watch along, reading oh, some really of the reviews for this. Oh yeah, because some of the reviews were like literally just like, oh yeah, we get to see them smash the patriarchy, and then one of the other reviews is like, uh, uh this this is uh. Uh, well justified a thing that women have been angry about for so long and it's like okay did you you're, are you rating the movie or are you rating like based on your political fucking team because you yeah, are the exact the same points. fucking person as all the people that are promoting Sound of Freedom going like it's the movie that liberals don't want you to see because they're yeah. all pedophiles <laughs> like it's you're just the same <laughs> fucking shit just, <laughs> yeah. st just be a real fucking human being for once stop being an NPC think for yourselves Jesus Christ it's so annoying. Yeah, it's like the horseshoe thing, right? Yeah. It is it a just... horseshoe thing. It really is. <laughs> it's not, it's not so... equivalent as in like, oh, both sides are the same amount of bad in the same ways and have the same political power, right? There's some nuance to this conversation, but I just wish mm -hmm. that people were less tribalistic and I wish that people were actually being fair and open and honest and self-critical and, you know, all of these things that we think we try to be at least. Mm -hmm. um, it's just fucking obnoxious and brain rot. And you're just giving people ammo. You're giving people ammo when you <laughs> yeah, do this. Yeah, like if yeah. this movie came out 2015, people would be like, this is why Trump won. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is one of those things where it's just like, it makes the average person who can be swayed by just how annoying or prominent someone is being on a particular side. It makes them not like that side more. It like, there are people that are in the middle somewhere that are just like, they will go whichever direction the wind is turning, right? And in 2015, mm. we did see a lot of, like, equivalencies of this movie, but, you know, uh, across social media and in political discourse, etc., that really turned people off, yeah. you know? And you could blame this type of thing for Trump getting elected, even though 
you know, obviously this movie came out in 2019, but it breathes the same energy. It is exactly the same type of wrong <laughs> and the yeah. same type of stupid and just like, my God, you you shouldn't be having these conversations because you're not capable of having them in any sort of intelligent, substantive way. Remember we were talking about about dry grasses and yeah. something that Nuri Bilge Jalan probably got the name right. Uh, something that he does in his film so well is that he'll have characters arguing with each other and he explores different perspectives and it doesn't yeah. just feel like the writer arguing with himself because he understands whatever other side of the argument there is. You can't even tell which one he's on. You can't even tell which side he's on because it's the characters talking about these things. Yeah. It's the characters having these arguments. In this film, it's so fucking obvious what the perspective of the writer is and that every single character is the writer and you get scenes like the way that they justify their secret society. It's like, well, we were so scared of being uh, called out for rape that we had to uh, silence women <laughs> it's like you mm -hmm. don't even like have a little bit of nuance have like just show us that you understand what reality is show us that you understand what empathy is show us th that you understand what the conversation e even is instead of this weird fucking like nonsense bubble of the whitest fucking feminism imaginable <laughs> the yeah. whitest upon whitest of feminism that you uh -huh. pretend isn't because you threw a black character in it and that's it it's like comical, Go fuck yourself. And, it, and it undercuts <laughs> itself at every corner as well. Like when it finally, towards the end, explains and has the whole dump about the the kind of fantasy elements and the haunted bust and this kind of stuff. It's like, oh my god, you're actually you're actually going there. <laughs> like <laughs> we talked about the when in the seventies version where we both kind of had slightly different interpretations. Where I, I was taking a bit more matter of fact, like it was just like a crazy person, and you were. In, interpreting more as sort of a fancy nightmare scenario type thing where it's it's not literal but this is like it's like preteen goofy like it's like twilight or something it's like so yeah <laughs> it's so unsubtle it's so it's, it's it was actually like jaw dropping it was i was i like had my ha my head in my hands for so much of this film um and then, like, w when they actually start dying, and it's all, like, edited and obscured to specifically hide the violence and cut around it, and it's like, what is the point of this film? Like, what? Even even the mystery element of this, like, cult angle, sure, that's something you could do, right? That's something you could explore. That's a, that's that's the twist of this movie, that there's there's not just two killers, now it's a whole cult of killers who are, I guess killing people on christmas for some reason killing sorority girls on christmas but they ruin that early in the film with the main character like stumbling across a creepy hazing ritual and it's like well there goes any mystery or surprise with what is like <laughs> you can guess every single element and when the guy from saw like turns out to be the head of the cult it's like oh wow what a surprise that was the really suspicious guy from earlier who you saw and the <laughs> it's just like so mm -hmm so lazy like did they write this in in a day damn like what did, did twitter write this and honestly the only the only element that in hindsight is kind of interesting and like prophetic is more the the importance of that bust thing and like there's the whole they they, they want to take down the bust because it's like the bust of someone who represents something bad mm -hmm. and this was before the riots in 2020 where that became like a huge thing and that was like the only time i was like oh like there you go it, it did kind of predict something or have <laughs> some kind of commentary that like lines up with reality i guess i don't know that was like the only thing to me that was like oh this is weird that that happened but uh, i mean there was that conversation still happening pretty prominently before 2020 but i think in american political discourse um yeah, it's it's very uh what what's funny is I'm not even it, I'm not the type to um necessarily even just like dislike a movie because of its perspective. I think you can show me the exact no. same perspective. Like you could have someone who's like who has this exact same worldview and just make a better movie, right? Mm -hmm. You could just you could just have the commentary in the film in a way where it doesn't feel like it replaced the film, right? It's the difference between 
uh, a Pepsi uh, product placement in a David Fincher film versus the Pepsi product placement in World War Z, right? Is it something yeah. that's there that you can be like, oh, okay, that's cool that, that that's in the, well, whatever, like that's in the movie and you notice that it's in the movie and you can have different interpretations of why it's in the movie. Or did you stop the movie just to give us your lecture on how we should buy Pepsi, <laughs> right? That, that's <laughs> yeah, essentially yeah. what this is. And um, damn, there was another movie that uh, you haven't seen yet uh, that we'll hopefully be able to talk about uh, next episode. Not going to spoil anything for you, but there are very um, prominent uh, feminist messages in that film. And, you know, it's not... I'm not going to say anything about it, but yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of... <laughs> that. I'm, I know that there's examples of ways that th things can be done right uh, and not even necessarily have that drastically different of a perspective than this film it's the way in which these ideas are presented yeah. and I would just say, the, the absolute childishness that you can tell goes yeah. into how they thought about this these <laughs> ideas it's definitely childish that's yeah. that's a great way to refer to it as because i mean yeah what you're saying is true but if you, if you talk about a film like get out like titan it is communicating these similar kind of progressive ideas, but it's still a good movie. It has scenes, it has characters, it has, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a film. Whereas I just don't see any element outside of that kind of like empty commentary yeah. present. That's all it has. It, it's, 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 we have Jordan Peele at home. <laughs> it's, it's, we, <laughs> yeah. we have, we have Barbie at home, right? It's just, it's, it's, absolutely fucking useless and some of these some of these scenes really piss me off especially when the, all that's left is just the commentary it's like you're watching somebody's vlog right mm -hmm. um so they say things in the movie like uh men get away with everything they say that they say that earlier and then both characters agree men do get away with everything and then they have later in the film oh, i can't we can't go to the police because what are we going to tell them if we were in a physical altercation? They'll just believe the man. Mm -hmm. It's like, what fucking reality? I'm, I, I'm sorry. Like, there's, there's tons of, of substantive, legitimate feminist commentary, right? In reality, there's, there's unique struggles mm -hmm. that women have that men don't have to deal with. There's struggles on, you know, both genders. And there are conversations that can be had about those types of struggles. But you cannot pretend <laughs> like like cops show up to a physical altercation and they just take the man's side and like prisons just, <laughs> oh, you know, overwhelmingly filled with women. Right. Yeah. Like this is this is this this is not even an opinion. This is like an empirically measured thing. This is the same crime. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Different gender. We know for a fucking fact men get sent to prison more often. We know for a fucking fact if there's a physical al altercation, chances are statistically you know, the men gets mm -hmm. locked up and they believe the woman's side of it. You know, if you have like physical evidence or, or bruises or anything, right? This is this is a factually measured thing. This isn't a theoretical thing. This is, are you acknowledging reality? And she's yeah. not. And, uh, and, and she's, not she's, in the she's, nuance. she's put it in her film as though it is fact. And that's all there is to the film. <laughs> and that's the entire movie. Yeah. Is just her commentary. Yeah. And it's it's baby's interpretation of of gender commentary. It's baby's interpretation of of gender any kind of feminist critical theory, mm -hmm. right? You're not saying anything interesting. You're showing us that you're a child. You're showing us that you that you have literally a child's understanding of the universe, and that you shouldn't be anywhere near a script. Jesus. Yeah. Or uh, I was thinking about I recently saw Jennifer's body for the first time. Still have it. Kind of, it was kind of does what this movie was like trying to do, but to actually some success because like it has interesting dialogue. It's like that quippy dialogue. It has a bit more of like a comedic slant. It like knows what it's trying to be, whereas like the the, the mere fact it's just not interested in anything to do with the genre that it's in just destroys it from moment one. Like, it has no chance. Like, Oh, yeah, who is this for? Who is it for? <laughs> yeah, and the foundation is just so flimsy. What can you build on top of it? Nothing, nothing. There is nothing. It's it's actually crazy, this film. <laughs> like, it's crazy that it even got made to me. Yeah. It, it's it's shockingly bad. It, this is... This is uh, 
it, it, your explanation of Jason Blum producing this makes a lot of sense now. It does really feel like <laughs> yes. a uh, just toss him a bone trip. sort of <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, I guess we'll and I guess, find this one. And yeah, because like he's the one in power. Either. Like the only yeah. way you can do anything about the critique is to <laughs> actually do something, because he's the one holding the the money and the power, and he green, green lights this uh, five million dollars just wasted. Yeah, just thrown into the trash and burnt. Like three, uh, two people, two people writing the script as well. Like. If they spent more than a day on this, I'd be I'd be shocked and honestly offended. <laughs> like what? That's funny. I, I honestly can't. I can't even really find the words to like justify how mad this made me. How it just it's just lazy. That's what gets me the most. It's just lazy. Like you, you got nothing to say. You're not interested in like the, any conversation to be had around these subject matters or anything unique or. Man, it's it's saying nothing. It's self fulfilling. It's, it's masturbatory. It's self fulfilling, but it pre it presents itself as if it is like saying something, it's saying something important. It's saying something that needs to be said. Where it's like, well, oh yeah, not not really. It's not really. <laughs> it's not original. It's not a, a unique like deconstructive spin on that original one in any way. It's not modernizing the concepts of the original. It's not got any unique angle. In fact, it's the most. It's as like embarrassing as an equivalent as like these weird reactionary like Daily Wire like westerns and things or the like weird. I saw an advert for a new like animated show they're releasing that's just like you know all the jokes are about like woke people and all the stuff you'd exactly expect. It's just mm -hmm. the exact inverse of that. Yeah, you know? children. Just chil children pretending to do political commentary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. condescending in that way, yeah. It's it's fascinating. I would buy this movie on 4K Blu-ray if it existed. This is a funny movie. <laughs> really? It's a funny movie to me. It's it's up there. It's like, a, it's a very, um, it, I, just, I laugh, I laugh at it. The Avengers Assemble scene. Women. <laughs> it's crazy. That That's scene yeah. literally happens in the boys. Like they, they are making fun of it in this yeah. exact way. It's it's crazy. And that oh man. Yeah, I, I I was yeah, quite shocked by how bad this one was. And I guess that's maybe why in the two thousand and six one discussion I sound way more positive on it, because this coming after that was like, man, I'd I'd watched Black Christmas two thousand and six like a hundred times before. No, nah, no, nah, this one Go I get more out of man. there's more to chew on here. I want to learn, like, I feel like I could watch this again and just, like, get more into, the, like, the deranged baby psyche of this director. <laughs> just, like, how yeah, fucking like that, awful of a person she must be. I was intrigued by this director, too, and, uh, like, I was looking at their IMDb to try and see, like, what was it that got this greenlit, I guess, or at least got her attached to it, and I couldn't really find any <laughs> good justification. She I, I, doesn't really seem particularly well-known or anything. There's a, a vague link to VHS the original mm -hmm. um where i think she acted in or something like this so i don't know i don't know how that came together but it doesn't seem like a match made in heaven and man i there's just something about blumhouse bad blumhouse horror that it just pisses me off unlike so many other types of films like it something about it's just like it doesn't need to be this bad you guys are just so fucking lazy why are you doing this oh just you make money easy or uh God, it, Blumhouse just pissed me off so much. Yeah, I don't understand how you can release this and not know ahead of time that everybody's going to hate it and it's not going to do well and nobody's going to see it. <laughs> like, how can you... Like, it's the most predictable thing on the fucking planet. If, you, if you're if you alive yeah. on planet Earth, <laughs> like, you would understand very easily that this is the exact type of thing that everybody hates and nobody likes. Yes. This is the exact, crazy though, like, this, this is across the board bipartisan hatred for this, right? So, some group of people put up $5 million. $5 million for this to get made. That, that wouldn't guess. have been just one person. It would have been a, a suite of people all investing in this. And you're telling me they all watched it and were like, yeah, brilliant. Put that out into the world. There's there's your artistic statement you wanna you wanna add to the pile, and then again like in the conversation like the fact that it is a Black Christmas remake slash ode thing, the way that Nothing manifests in it. the film is so 
weird like in the first five minutes they like reference the the unicorn i was like what yeah why <laughs> like <laughs> Like the cat why are you was even in referencing it? it? They had a white the, cat oh, and, in this one, and the cat's got a girl name now instead of a boy name. It's oh, called that now instead of Claude that. from the original. Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's the kind of level. <laughs> yep, it's uh, really uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, I don't know, like. Ew. Did anybody expect I don't find the film interesting, good? but I would find I would like to hear the justification from the director as to like yeah, let's their watch approach interviews. to this. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a commentary track. I would oh, watch that. Fuck. Is that's there the only track? chance. Oh, I gotta get the Blu-ray if there's a if there was. Track. That's right, the only. Hold on. Uh, yeah, find out because that would be kind of funny. Uh, that's the only chance I'd ever watch this again. Is with Christmas a embarrassing game. commentary track. Yeah. That's got to be... I hope it exists. Oh, there is a feature commentary. All right, here it is. Oh, feature really? Co- feature commentary, it says on the Oh, back. who's on it? Does it say? Uh, it does not say. Oh, interesting. So I'm going to have... It's, it just says feature commentary. That's it on the back of the Blu-ray. Yeah, that would be interesting. Outside of that, I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to buy this movie. <laughs> 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 got to do it. Oh, man. I think, it's all, I think it's cheap. It better be cheap. $8. <laughs> for the blu-ray that's not bad there's not a 4k what there's not a 4k it's on 4k on digital <laughs> but there's not yeah no 4k blu-ray unfortunately i know crime yeah well uh what i learned is that men get away with everything not not rich men not rich white men but all men <laughs> poor black men get away with everything <laughs> is what i learned <laughs> um <laughs> and uh that's true they even make the point of that with that character that's not all hilarious. men. Did you just say not all men? Did you not all men me? <laughs> bah, 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 bah. <laughs> so the like this this film is everything that if you listen to Ben Shapiro about the Barbie movie, you would have assumed <laughs> right. it was. Yeah, yeah. This this film this film is the straw man that conservative yeah. uh grifting commentators will claim that any random feminist or slightly woke or whatever you mm-hmm. call it movie is this one is the real deal <laughs> this one is their yeah. boogeyman f- fully realized <laughs> yeah. we found it's it so <laughs> politically shallow and dishonest this 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 is the yeah this is this is the uh quintessential <laughs> woke movie well, or whatever yeah. we want to call and it, it was so it was so unclear to me at first like if it was trying to be funny or have a satirical angle and i was like so confused by that because there was like the character that is presented as being like the most progressive um and like has the most kind of catchphrasey talking pointy dialogue uh there's a scene with her where they're buying a christmas tree and she goes over to the the most enormous extravagant tree in the lot and it's like i'm gonna choose this one let's get this one and they're like oh well, how are you gonna afford that and she's like yeah my i've got my dad's card and he's like loaded i was like oh they're gonna oh. like is this more of like a satire thing then? Are they going to try to make out like this is more of like a bubble type opinion thing? And it's more like I don't know what it was going for. Look at this spoiled <laughs> r- rich. I don't know. Yeah, but then I like, think it, it just wasn't self aware. I think that these yeah, were characters that exactly you were right. like inherently supposed to enjoy or find relatable or root for just because it's a feminist movie and they're women or something. I think like I think that was the implication. <laughs> Because like you look, you like any rational, like non uh, tribalistic person looks at that scene where like she's, did you just not all me? Did you like chasing him out the door? And you're like, you're not the good person in this dispute. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're you're being the aggressor. Like you t- strip away the genders for a second. Think of mm-hmm. people as people, right? <laughs> Have empathy. She's being the aggressor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Straight he's, up. He's, yeah, I don't know what. Why is it? Yeah, it's such a bizarre and disturbing and sick and twisted uh, perspective from the film. That is, uh, yeah, you might as well just you. This this might as well be Sound of Freedom. And there's no Shit bottle like element, or at least really. how people reviewed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just completely misses the forest. It's. I thought this was like incredibly embarrassing. Yeah. It's very I think funny. Everyone yeah. involved with this should be embarrassed. Oh hell yeah! It's, like, <laughs> it's up there. I'm about to buy it. <laughs> it's yeah. It should be pointed out and laughed for how just shallow and dishonest and just uninterested in like any real artistic discussion or 
philosophical debate or anything. It's just it. it's just completely empty. Fuck this film. Half star. Get out of my face. Get out of my face. Um, I give this one a two out of ten. I think that if we so in my mind, if I'm judging the film, any of these films in if the goal of the movie was to make a movie i think that this <laughs> did it a little bit better than the 2006 one i think that that like <laughs> this this resembles what a movie is more closely than the 2006 one it's a bad movie it's an annoying movie the perspective of the movie is insane and it's the preachiest worst script maybe ever <laughs> no, maybe not. i don't know actually maybe yes maybe ever um but it still feels like more of a movie <laughs> and it's still, I feel like I can understand the intent of the filmmakers a bit better in this film, even though what they're intending on doing is shit and what they wanted to do was shit and they made a shit movie. But I feel like I got more out of it in the sense of like, you know, I, I was never as confused of like, what is this trying to be? It's just like, Oh, I see what you're trying to be. It's just terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I give this one a two out of 10. I think it's slightly better than the uh, 2006 one, but I also think that the 2006 film is like the lowest bar. Like you can't, 2006 one is like maybe worst of the decade material. Like <laughs> really? you can't, you can't really get much worse than that in terms of like, what was your goal to make a movie? I don't even know. I don't even know if that. Yeah, was at the least goal. the 2006 one managed to achieve killing hot girls, which is like their main goal. You know. Like, I mean, some of the we we didn't even see that. We don't even know if it killed Mary Elizabeth Winston. <laughs> yeah, and you get the funny. You didn't, scene you didn't see her get killed. You like we we even in even on that standard. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if it actually completes its goal. Like, did she just leave to film Final Destination three? And they're like, okay, we'll just we'll You're just explode a blood bag in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so low two out of ten for the 2019 one. It's closer to a one than a three. Um. But uh, I'm glad we watched those. I thought it uh, turned out pretty good for a trilogy. It's yeah, one movie and two remakes discussion. Unique and like completely different in how they <laughs> in their approach. Yeah, I guess very different. I'm I am yeah. glad that the 2019 one wasn't just 2006 again, but also you know just incompetent in the same sorts of ways. Yeah, or it's like more interesting than the the Japanese Cube remake or whatever. You know, it's more. It's more out there and crazy, it feels like, than mm -hmm. something as bland as that. Yeah. All right, let's do a couple questions from the Sardonicast community then. Head over to the suggestion thread on the subreddit where we can answer uh, questions like this one from Greenhood300. Only four words here. Thoughts on Mr. Beast. <laughs> He's like a weirdly controversial figure in the, in the YouTube space. Um, I can't really, I can't really deal with watching the videos myself. They're a bit too like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. They're so like tailor made for the the engagement, and you can like feel it. Um, he's it always like, been very good at that. He is, he is like this is like the late stage YouTube engagement sort of thing. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he makes he makes good content in that sense, right? He's like the Marvel movies where well when they were at their peak at least. It's right, like yeah. the Marvel movies of YouTube is like, oh, you figured out exactly what sells and you're making something that like most people, if they watched it, would not like dislike, I guess. Yeah. Uh, children love it. Some adults love it. Yeah. I mean, like he's got like good concepts for videos. Um, for a while, I knew nothing about him other than everybody was just trying to suck his dick on Twitter because they thought he would give them money like an Elon Musk type. <laughs> You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> Where if someone's known for for their money, you'll see a lot of people just being like, "Oh, please, I love everything you do." Um, which is not a commentary on him; it's a commentary on the you know other people that surround him. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't have any issue with him really. Yeah, it's uh, the one kind of weird knock on effect. I feel like I've seen like kind of as a response to the Mr. Beast popularity and movement is kind of a resurgence of do you remember during the it's just a prank era there was like just before that there was this whole like social experiment like obsession you know where mm -hmm. it's like I'm, I'm gonna go up and like film a homeless person and do something that makes me look good type thing um 
not saying that Mr. Beast does that necessarily, but the I've seen like a uprising on like people doing that kind of content again in like YouTube mm -hmm. shorts and like I'm gonna go up to a homeless person and uh offer them five hundred quid or double it to the next person and we're gonna do this whole like let's all feel good about giving each other money type thing. Um I don't know. If a That's politician is improving people's lives and their only motivation is to get elected the next year and they don't actually care, I still think it's a good thing. If the net result is people's lives being improved. And in that same sense, on a different, smaller scale, if Mr. Beast is only curing people's blindness <laughs> to look good, I think the net result is still a good thing. Um, one could, you know, the, the, res the, the actions of like... An, em an empath and a sociopath, if it's the same action, I'm going to think that it's a good action, that it's a net good for people. Um, we might think differently about the person, maybe, but, I mean, it's... What, you want to stop him from, like, being a good person? I mean, I guess the other end of yeah. the conversation is just tax people more, but, I mean, he's not, a, he's not like a billionaire. He just spends a lot of money on his... He, he just puts a lot back into the content. He makes a lot of money. He's probably hundreds of millions at this point. I don't know. Tens of millions? Mm -hmm. he's, at least a, he's at least a tens of millions of error. And I feel like... I feel like him being kind of at the top of the hierarchy makes sense. And it doesn't... It, it, it doesn't, like, annoy me like T-Series or something. Like a big True. thing like that. I like that it's... Someone who, like, loves YouTube, I guess, and, like, understands it and not just, like, a megacorp type thing that just is at the top. Um, yeah. But it's not like I'm... Yeah. It's not that passionate either way about him, to be honest. I think he's pretty cool, and uh, I, that only saying that because of my want him to give me money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I think it, no, there's some... Uh, he doesn't seem like a bad guy, He, but he just no. also kind of seems like a machine... Uh, <laughs> just like <laughs> the end result of like an ai that's fake you know you know like the um some people will use i forget what it's called i think they make like scripts to like beat a mario game or something in ways that are much more precise than a normal human being could it feels like that but like the youtube algorithm mm. where like he's he's like an ai that was trained to figure out exactly how to <laughs> Like min max, <laughs> fucking YouTube. Yeah, it is very min maxy. Yeah, down to the thumbnails and everything with like overexposed kind of colors and the faces yeah. doing the certain. And everybody copies and... him. He's like he he mm -hmm. is what people copy, which yeah. you know you're doing something right if everybody's fucking trying to copy you, or at least you know mm -hmm. you're being successful at it. Um, yeah, it's cool that. Um, remember, I was telling you about that like really terrible uh, video from. Uh, what the fuck is their name sunny v2 yeah 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 so like it, it is kind of cool that like um mr beast i don't even know his name <laughs> the beast boy the beastie boy. <laughs> beast boy um it's it's cool that you know he's retained that friend chris and uh, accepted them for who they are and hasn't like um you know diminished their presence on the channel um which is i mean depending on what circle you're in, it's like, okay, that's the least someone could do. But in other, a lot of other circles, considering how popular he is and considering he is at the top, and in order for him to have that audience, there's got to be a huge chunk of, like, p either children or conservatives or both uh, that just don't think trans people should be in a video <laughs> and yeah. think that it's, like, inherently a bad thing. So I like that he is kind of just going, like, no, I'm, you know, fuck it whatever he's still at the top it hasn't hurt his brand and i'm glad that he didn't get scared about that and caved into uh the hive mind of uh mm -hmm. you know agreed yeah okay so that that much is cool about him how about this one then from it's slider 19 hey fellas the other day i was talking to a friend about stanley kubrick's a clockwork orange i'm an avid fan of the film it it being my favorite Kubrick joint. I've never heard a Kubrick film being referred to like that before, but she told me that she found it offensive, claiming that what film? by its de uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, okay. claiming that by depicting graphic sequences of SA and uh, violence, it was sensationalizing and trivializing said horrid actions and behaviors. Of course, the film is a satire and makes no claim for its graphic scenes. 
nor against it. Therein lies much of the contro controversy for the film. By not coding such behavior as clearly bad, I think it leads many to misunderstand the intended purpose of depicting such scenes. My question is, what do you think about A Clockwork Orange's depiction of SA? And to follow up, how do you think such topics should be depicted? And what are examples of, dare I say, good examples of these things in other films? So there's a... I feel like I mentioned this a, a few episodes ago or in the in the previous months. There's just more and more discourse, I feel like, around like sex scenes and considering mm -hmm. them irrelevant or unnecessary. Unnecessary being a big one. There's a little bit of a popular unnecessary sex scenes in films thread I saw going around on Twitter the other week that had, I don't know, had like 50,000 likes and it was starting the thread with that scene from Oppenheimer. Where, that's uh, that's an engagement farming Twitter account. I've seen that. Literally every definitely. single one of their tweets is like, name well, this, that, I'll start. I don't even yeah, think exactly. it's a real opinion. <laughs> most of Twitter is that now, to be fair. Oh yeah, that's literally most stuff. of Twitter. You're absolutely right. Um, but I don't know. There's just something weird about that because there does seem to be more and more of a push or at least discussion about this idea of it being unnecessary or somehow something we shouldn't include in stories, despite sexuality being so important and crucial to society, to human storytelling. Um, so that's kind of my stance on that. Like, if these things are real and it's more just the tact of how you approach them. Like, we were just saying the the... The commentary in Black Christmas 2019 and what it's trying to deal with is not subtle and it falls on its face um, and it's a horrible example of dealing with that kind of subject matter, but an equally like unsubtle uh, broaching of the same subject matter is something like The Boys, but they pull it off because it's, it's framed in kind of a far more interesting or kind of crazy gonzo way. Um, so yeah, I have no problem with like sex scenes or more like violence being depicted as long as it's justified and you have something to say and you're trying to make some kind of artistic statement or peace with it. Um, these things are, you know, it's a part of humanity and if we're being re real with each other, yeah, we're, you know, stuff like this is England show, like that happens and um, it would be crazy to me to not have this stuff in in stories but you do need a delicate touch that's for sure so yeah the the conversation is I, I i think more trying to uh get at the tone in which some of the these horrid you know horrendous violent acts are uh being portrayed in so like um the music and like i feel pretty you know like mm -hmm. the the excited nature that the film doesn't explicitly just show you and being like, this is bad and play like bad, scary music. And like, this is mm. a bad, scary thing happening to these people. I love that it's juxtaposed. I love that we maybe perhaps feel the same excitement and, and insanity uh, terribly from a moral perspective, but we can understand the characters a bit more. We understand that those psychopaths hurting those people feel that way when it's happening. And I, I love that it's removing us uh, from the reality of that situation um, from, you know, it, it, it almost makes it more scary thinking about how mm -hmm. much joy that person would be experiencing as they're doing this terrible thing to you. So if let's say you're attaching yourselves onto the victims in the scene in Clockwork Orange, I think it's way more fucked up that there's not a shred of remorse, that there's not a shred of like, um, you know, thinking about it being morally bad from those characters that they're mm -hmm. just having fun. They're not going to stop. It doesn't matter how much pain you're in. It doesn't matter how much, how terrible this is. It doesn't matter how fucked up it is. I think that that works for the film a lot better. There's tons of examples of films where people can take away the, the wrong interpretation, right? Wolf of Wall Street, right? Any Scorsese mm -hmm. movie, right? Is it cool American that they're Psycho, doing yeah. the thing or is it bad that they're doing the thing? American Psycho, yeah. Um... I I do really love films that aren't afraid to be morally ambiguous. I do really mm -hmm. love films that aren't afraid 
to even make you feel like fun or excitement over like uh, something horrific happening because I don't know, maybe my brain's a little bit different. I'm maybe a bit more able to distinguish friction from reality uh, than some people. But this Mm. goes into the same conversation as like violent video games. I'm sorry. It's fun to shoot people in the head in a video game. It's not fun to do it in real life. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it is fun to do it in real life. I don't know. I don't feel compelled to try it. <laughs> um, but like, you know, you, you, even even just like ignoring the violence, just moral choices in general. I play as a renegade in Mass Effect. I think it's more interesting. I think it's more fun. It's called role play, right? You're, mm-hmm. I, I, it's not me in real life. I'm it's exploring really, a yeah. character, right? Uh, in that same sense, films can explore characters and you can experience emotions of that character through the film and if the film does a great job at doing that maybe i don't know perhaps there's some people in on the planet that are really fucked up and they might see it as jerk off material can't really stop that either way they might be imagining it (laughs) otherwise Mm -hmm. um yeah i let let artists be what they want let them express things how they want and if it's really well made and um you know, we don't we don't want to have a morality police uh, trying to enforce uh, the you know intended emotion of a scene. Right? Is uh, Full Metal Jacket a war film or an anti-war film? You know, sometimes people get confused. <laughs> yeah, um, it's really up to the interpretation, and uh, it's another conversation, I guess, about media literacy, um, mm-hmm. and also just I don't know, assuming ig- ignorance over malice at the very least. Yeah. It does feel like a lot of people just the second they get uncomfortable, they just like want to yeah try and hide it or something. Or I love being uncomfortable. Act like other, but yeah, that's that's why I love horror. That's why I love thrillers. That's why I love stories. <laughs> you know, it's, it is role play of the mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, man, let's just take a step back and yeah, get improve our media. Let's just see a little bit. That would be great. <laughs> um. Should we do one more here? Do Let's do it. I send on this one then from Goosey McGooseface2. Hello, Suds. With the GTA 6 trailer blowing up, what's your history with the GTA series? What are your favorite entries and what do you consider to be the strengths and weaknesses of the games? Wishing you, lads, a Merry Christmas and all the best for 2024. Um, I was never really a GTA guy until 5. That's, that's the only one I've played in full. I've like only been like in the room when like a friend has been playing gta 4 or san andreas or whatever um it was never really my thing um i only really got into the the whole like satire angle and all the craziness uh the the sandbox in five which uh well there hasn't been one in a decade so there's not much (laughs) outside of that i was always more of a red dead guy myself that's that's what i'm after from rockstar uh i get the appeal i love the satire stuff I, i like that um and the fact it's made by like Scottish people to a Scottish town uh-huh. is kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I enjoyed five. Uh, I enjoyed the characters. I thought it was fun to play as, you know, the, the, those types of people. Um, you know, some <laughs> yeah. morally questionable psychopathic well, kind yeah of it's kind of what and, we're just saying do you remember yeah. that drama around the time uh gta 5 came out when uh th- there's a torture scene in the game where it's i guess it's like a parody of like <laughs> some of the things the american government have done to re- mm. <laughs> uh, get uh information out of people and you're doing it as trevor and there was this whole controversy about like should should this be allowed children are going to play this type thing um, yeah gta is so fucking immensely popular that like there's controversy around like every fart <laughs> that, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. that comes from the direction of rockstar headquarters right so i don't take much of it seriously people are just looking for reasons to be mad it's a you know a lot of video game m- moral m- panic satanic panic i don't know what the fuck you mm-hmm. call it but um yeah i i, I mean i i more or less have like the same history in the sense that like the gta 5 is the first one i played in full um i've heard some good things about uh three and four so i might revisit them at yeah, some point people love four i've played um, like tiny little snippets of them just sandboxily when i was younger but like at a friend's house but i've never uh yeah e- and there's no real good way to myself. go there's no good way to play four 
right now, and no. they kind of botched the that remake collection thing they did for some of the old ones. Um, using PS3? Using like half baked uh, AI stuff. Um, yeah, I just I don't want to buy a PS3 again, man. Really you have a Steam Deck. There. Do you want me to teach True. you how to get a PS3 game True. on a Steam Deck? Just, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the that's the answer. Um, it literally is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. True, I hadn't considered that. Um, you should start considering so, it. So maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe that's the way to play them. Yeah, it is. I'm telling you that that's what you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have you have no that's more right. agency. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I like the story in five. I think I remember trying to start four and not being like as into the story because from memory, and I could be wrong, I think I'm, I tried starting it and just being like, what, this guy's like a moral character and then I just go outside and start punching people? Because like, if, if I'm in a sandbox right. game, I'm just going to like, <laughs> I'm just going to immediately yeah, contradict nuts. whatever uh, goody two-shoes, like good guy thing going yeah, on with the character. The so like, I remember in five, just like, oh, these people are psychopaths. That kind of helps, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, I could be completely wrong about four. I might be misremembering. I might be remembering a completely different game. I don't know. But I, I vaguely remember that being like a criticism and... Um, yeah, five was just so graphically great for the time, which is something that Rockstar is really incredible. Good at. Yeah. Um, I loved how many different games within the game there are. You could just like go do things. It's like, it's like what they promised, uh, fucking cyberpunk would be like, oh, you can go into a building right. and do the you know, fucking whatever. I thought the, the like character switching thing was quite cool as well. Yeah, that is like cool. Like when you switch to another character and it immediately loads to another place in the map and then it will have some kind yeah. of like animation or environmental storytelling of like what they've been doing when you weren't playing as them i thought that's like really cool stuff and play tennis <laughs> yeah, <you can> golf. <laughs> yeah it's cool i'll play gta 6 when it comes out um what's funny is i realize that they're probably going to do the uh not on pc for the first two years thing that yeah. they did with gta 5 yeah, and so we'll see We'll see how how much of a display of patience that I can have because GTA Five I just waited for the PC release. <laughs> oh, really? I experienced yeah, it yeah. for the first time on PC. I was like, yeah, I can wait. So we'll see what happens with Six. We'll see what what else is out and what my backlog of other games are. And uh, you know, if I'm going to play it on PC anyway, I might as well wait. But whatever, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I don't know how well it's going to what kind of pc you're going to need to like run it because it looks <laughs> just incredible uh as far as visual fidelity oh true um yeah but uh yeah i also think florida is like an awesome hell yeah you i agree some, you can get some funny stuff in there if it's like written right and that's the only thing i guess is the one or both of the hauser brothers who are like the 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 writers i guess the main lead writers um are gone now so i don't know if oh how that if that's going to affect the satire angle at all i'm sure like it's like the first like two billion dollar game like the budget so i'm sure i mean <laughs> they're gonna have like the best people probably in the in in the whole space on it so mm -hmm. yeah we'll see we'll see crazy the like most viewed video like uh on youtube in 24 hours or something like craziness almost almost i think it's like second place to like a bts music video Oh really? It was it was beaten out by that because I thought uh, Mr. Beast had the previous record. Of, like, oh, I don't know. Maybe it was like I'm sixty nine right. million views in twenty four hours, and the I don't care one got like eighty or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, sure I'm just going to spread misinformation. <laughs> I'm confident about this actually. My dad works at YouTube, and that's what he told me. <laughs> well, my dad works at Rockstar, so that's what he told me. Oh damn! <laughs> Did you leak it? Were you the leaker? Oh man, <laughs> that was man. I don't even know like how you'd reprimand your like seventeen year old son who's like destroyed your twenty year career <laughs> uh, at, at Rockstar Games, like the most reputable like developer it, in the I entire just, space. I just like, I just that, I don't even understand the point of leaking things. Yeah, for TikTok what likes. The fuck? That's Who literally cares? it. <laughs> None of you people can like have any impulse control. You're all like, oh please <laughs> yeah. leak some stuff, please leak it. It's not finished. Let them fucking release a trailer when they want. Yeah. All the people reporting on these leaks at like Insomniac of just being like, 
look at how shitty this Wolverine character model looks. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's not finished. <laughs> yeah, they don't you want you to it. see it. <laughs> That's what, What's the, the point? There's there's no conversation to be had in like I don't know. There's some leaks that no. were interesting. The Sony leaks were interesting, just like the emails and stuff. I'm more interested about the corporate shit. Don't give me like early versions of a product being worked on. Just to give me give me yeah. the give me the fucking nitty gritty details about how their business runs. Sure, give me give me that in a leak. Yeah, don't that's what's me, interesting. Yeah, like the whole uh, all the all the emails that came out with the like Activision uh, purchase by Microsoft and all these weird like internal dealings and these yeah. antitrust stuff and all this stuff that leaks out. That's, that's valuable. That's fascinating. That's that's awesome. that's, that's that's worthy like, of discussion and reporting. Leaking and, the hateful eight. That's just, it's just so pathetic. You know? Like why. Yo, you want to read this script <laughs> that, yeah. for a movie that's not out yet that it, he was working very hard on? Come on, help me ruin this for a bunch of people. Let's do it, man. <laughs> Let's spoil this shit. What's the, yeah, Ugh. I don't understand. I, I do not empathize with that mentality. I no, just don't get it. Me neither. It just seems like poor impulse control and boredom. It just seems yeah, like a combination it's a bit like, of that. So there's like an anarchy angle as well where it's like knowing this two billion dollar thing that you've got this like bit of information about yeah look at the, the power i've got now and if you're 17 years old i guess the 10,000 tiktok likes you get will be uh that's worth it for you in your mind i don't know yeah but, well i guess that's about it that is about it i think we did it throw a fucking movie at me i'm gonna throw <laughs> I don't know. I want to throw a Ken Loach at you right now. Okay. I want to throw a Ken Loach. I don't think either of us have seen uh, the wind that shakes the. Hell bottom. yeah! That's Killian been on Murphy. My watch list for a while. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been it. on mine for a while. Palm Looks door really winner. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we're in safe hands with this Ken Loach. I think we'll be all right. Um, I think this yeah, is a this safe, really <laughs> safe recommendation. Probably, hopefully, yeah. Been on my <laughs> yeah. watch list since fucking forever. Uh, 2007 Palm Door winner or 2006, sorry, um, Palm Door winner. Um, yeah, very excited. Uh, if you don't want to be spoiled for The Wind That Shakes the Barley, directed by Ken Loach and written by Paul Laverty, starring Killian Murphy, uh, 2006, watch it before the next episode's out. These episodes come out every two weeks, but you can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com, signing up for premium. It's only $2 a month. Also, patreon.com slash sardonicast will get you the same thing. Support the show. We are hungry. We eat that money. Starving. It's food. Feed. Money is food. And also, we're men and we get away with everything, so you have to. Um, boys will be boys. <laughs> uh, we also got a Sardonicast highlights channel on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to that. You can hear little snippets of discussions and like the best bits. Uh, hit the bell on YouTube if you're on YouTube. Subscribe to the Sardonicast and hit the bell so you know when these things come out publicly. If you're not going to give us money, you might as well. It's the least you could do. <laughs> uh, we got merch. Link in the description. And uh, did I forget something? I think <laughs> so, that's it. I think you covered the whole gambit then. I think we got it. And have a, a happy forever, forever mentioning Valerian in this podcast i hope everyone had a black christmas 1974 huh? and not a black christmas <laughs> 2019 <laughs> yeah 2019 black christmas is probably where a lot of people got covid so yeah yeah you exactly right. like right at the end you of the year we'd be thinking about that man yeah all right happy shrek or something bye everybody thanks for listening hey.